Oh, I see us. Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this very first episode. I want to make sure, can everyone hear me in the chat room? Say that you can hear me before I say a whole bunch of stuff and it's all muted. We can hear you. I don't know. Hear you. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, it is so nice to have people here on a Friday night uh, in this, you know, summer starting up. It's real warm here at the moment in this jungle that I'm in. And, uh... We are doing, the summer has no movies, so we might as well every Friday night read a movie that was never made for some of the biggest franchises out there. Uh, so it seems like we're all good, so I'm going to start reading this thing that I wrote here. I mean, off the cuff, introduction. Here it is. I'm going to mute you, you all you people. You be quiet while I say things. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so... We are going to read a real Hollywood script. This was this is a real script, never made. Um, and today is our first official episode, and we'll be reading the first half of Indiana Jones and the Monkey King, a.k.a. Indiana Jones and the Garden of Life, a.k.a. Indiana Jones 3, written in 1985 by Chris Columbus. Yeah. Chris Columbus, uh, as you may know, wrote Gremlins and Goonies and the movie Nine Months, uh, which we're all excited to remember. And he also directed Home Alone, Mrs. Doubtfire, the first two Harry Potter movies, and Nine Months. So let's just remember that Hugh Grant and Julianne Moore were in a wacky pregnancy comedy with Jeff Goldblum and uh, Robin Williams as an OBGYN. So... Uh, that man is responsible for what you are about to witness today, because this script is ridiculous. Um, a little bit of history. This was intended to be the third Indiana Jones movie uh, instead of Last Crusade. Uh, it's based off an eight-page outline by George Lucas himself. So, man, a uh, funny thing that I read is that... Um, at, so when he got the first film out... Uh, before it was released, he said, I've got ideas for, for so many stories to fill at least three, three other movies. And then they're like, oh, this is one of the biggest hits ever. We need a sequel. And he's like, oh, I don't really, oh, I don't really have anything. My wife's leaving me. Um, hmm. All right, well, <laughs> he, uh, he did end up writing this outline uh, for the third film. So we will see that uh, Steven Spielberg ended up passing on this script. One, because of the supernatural elements in there. I will say there is an entire ghost story in the beginning. A cold open ghost story in Scotland that starts us off. And after reading the script, he was said to feel... I began to feel very old. Too old to direct this film. And that is very true. Because I think this movie could never have been made in 1985. And you will see why. For, for one spoiler just to keep you watching, uh, Indiana Jones does ride a rhinoceros and fight a tank. So we're gonna get there eventually, so stick with us on this journey. Um, but that's enough backstory. Let us uh, get uh, to our patient, patient actors who have agreed to this uh, right here. So we have Mr. Ted Evans, who will be playing Indiana Jones. You know him from all of our wonderful Big Head videos. Super talented voiceover man. Uh, he's gonna do a great job as Indiana Jones. And then as in love interest number one, Cheryl Lasley as Betsy Tuffett, uh, also from many Big Head videos as well. And you've seen her all over. She's just everywhere. She's just a comedy force that just happens and You'll usually see her in a lot of things with Dr. Claire Clark, which is not her real name. Her real name is Dee Dee Drake, playing Dr. Claire Clark, the second love interest of Indiana Jones, because he needs two. He needs two. It's the third movie. You gotta up the love interests. Um, but yes, they have a uh, amazing show uh, that's Sharon Dee Dee Fix Your Life which I don't know where that's streaming, but we can give plugs and things. Um, but I love it, and they're super talented. And she is also in uh, Big Head Terminator as Sarah Connor. And then we've got uh, over here, we've got Isaac Robinson-Smith, who I have not met until this very moment. 
but I've heard his demo reel, a uh, very talented voice actor. I know he works at Disney, uh, various things. He's, uh, uh, from what I've heard, he's fantastic. We'll be the judge by the end of this. Maybe he'll be in the next one. Maybe he won't. We don't know. But he's playing Scraggy Briar, who is Indy's, uh, basically the, the short round, or uh, John Reese davies uh, Sala for this episode. And then we've got uh, Mr. Brock Powell, who is, uh, he's, he's looking around. He doesn't know what's going on. And he is going to be playing villains and a series of other random characters. Uh, another super talented voice actor. You may know him as the Kool-Aid Man. And uh, in many different video games, uh, one of which that made me very angry, God of War, his bug character in it. <laughs> he's an elf. He's not a bug. I don't care. He was really annoying. Anyway, I love you, Brock. It's going to be fun. And then finally, we've got... Uh, John Steins, who will be playing Marcus Brody, as well as a bunch of different side characters. Uh, again, so many talented voice actor folks here and comedians. And we've got myself doing all of the narration. And Megan Gorman is the moderator. You all be very nice to Megan Gorman. She is going to be in charge of getting suggestions of voices from you. And uh, she has all of the power. So she'll be running the chat, so you can talk to her and things, and she'll be making notes on comments and voices and things like that. So, whew, I said a lot of stuff. Now, how this works. As we're just reading, we don't want to just do a normal script read. So, while the script is going, uh, I am, from time to time, going to have the actors change their voices at my whim, whatever. They, they give me a list of 10 different voices that they like to do, and I'll be pulling from those initially. And then at some point, I might end up calling out to Megan to go to the chat room and pick out some voices as well to uh, challenge them. And so I do want to say celebrity impressions are very nice, but you know it's hard sometimes to do all those. So general character uh, suggestions are really great too. Like a woman who really enjoys the art of macrame, but is being eaten by a lion. See how that goes. <laughs> um. <laughs> Things like that. This is just what's off the top of my head. And oh so the other thing that I will be adding is this is an action movie. So there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of action scenes in it. So rather than me just reading giant tons of action scene, you know, description, I'm going to do something called the action gauntlet. So when an action scene comes up, I'm going to say action gauntlet and name one of our fine actors. Then they're going to be reading about two pages of an action scene and I'm going to randomly be saying new voice and going directly to Megan to take your suggestions and have them keep reading in whatever that voice is. They might not, they might be able to do it, they might not. Who cares, we're just gonna keep going so we can get through these action scenes. Um, I will do the very first one to show that I can, I, I will do this too. I will go through the same torture as I'm putting all of you through. And uh, here we go. I think, I think that is all that we need for the beginning. And we can now, uh, begin Indiana Jones and the Monkey King. So everyone unmute your microphones and uh, oh, and remember this is, like I said, the first half of the script because it takes a long time to read these scripts, especially changing voices. So we're gonna do the first half now, second half on uh, next Friday. So here you go. Everyone ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so here it is, Indiana Jones 3, first draft by Chris Columbus, February 10th, 1985. Underwater close-up. A brightly colored fly attached to a dangling fishing line. A large salmon swims to the fly. The salmon examines the fly, deciding whether or not to bite. Camera pans upward, tracking the line and moving out of the water. We pass the crooked boards of a small rowboat and continue to pan upward. A man reclines in the boat, napping. His hands gently grip a wooden fishing pole. He is handsomely dressed in sportsman's trousers and a blazer. His green tweed fishing hat is lowered over his face. Its brim is filled with various types of tackle and bait. It is dusk, a warm summer evening. The boat rests on a calm lake surrounded by moors. Thick night fog has begun to settle over the entire area. Title, Scotland, 1937. Suddenly, the man's fishing line begins, becomes taut. The wooden pole buckles. The man stirs. He sits up, moving the hat from his face. Camera dollies forward into a close-up of the man. It is Indiana Jones. His face, anxious, hopeful, 
Indy begins to reel in his catch. A voice interrupts in the distance. This is McGowan, who you can do whatever voice you want to start with. He's Scottish. Have fun. Dr. Jones! Dr. Jones! Indy turns to the direction of the sound, still struggling with the line. Indy's POV. Countless orange flames sparkle across the moors. The torches are being carried by several members of a small village. The villagers are gathering behind a group of six policemen. The policemen are headed by Inspector Angus McGowan, a plump, balding fellow with a veiny, bulbous nose, beady green eyes, and a thick, curled red mustache. Ma uh, McGowan shouts to Indy. We need your assistance! Come on, Mac. It's the first bite I've had all week. Please! It's very important! Indiana struggles a bit longer with the line, but his conscience prevails, and Indy drops the fishing pole. With a grumble, he rolls back to shore. The moor is several, several minutes later. Night has fallen. It is very dark. A reluctant Indiana has joined the inspector and the other policemen. They lead the townspeople along the foggy moors. Slowly, carefully, the villagers search, creeping, their faces tense, many unable to hide their fear. A summer wind sends an eerie howl whistling through the night air. Blue moonlight bathes the moors, creating stark, frightening shadows. An expression of anger and annoyance over Indiana's face, he grumbles to McGowan. Do you value our friendship, Mac? More than me notly pipe! Then this better not be some wild goose chase. Take wild geese when after Dr. Jones. You got me word on that. And the McGowan's word is truer than an angel's kiss. This is... There is a sudden scream. Ah. There it is. <laughs> I love it. One of the villagers stumbles upon something. Everyone gathers around the villager. A corpse lies before them. The body has a somewhat rubbery appearance, as if all its bones had been broken. The man's pale greenish face is frozen in a hideous grimace. Indiana and McGowan stare in shock. The villagers whisper among themselves, and here are your voices. All right, young man, uh, man and old man will be played by John Steins, and they will be three different Pennywises. <laughs> I know there's only two, Make up what a third Pennywise would be. Uh, so that will be three Pennywises. And then there is a uh, woman and an old woman. And that will be played by, well, a, a chicken and a granny, respectively. All right, here you go. Daddy Ferguson. He is the eighth. Just like the others, all his bones busted. Crushed. Whatever's killing people around here I ain't human, I'm a clown. <laughs> <laughs> Subtitle, it's there, again. <laughs> the woman shoots forward. The police and the townspeople are right behind her. A curious Indiana follows. The woman stops in a clearing. She is pointing ahead. The villagers surround her. They stare ahead in the direction where the woman points. Nearly a mile in the distance, we see an ancient Scottish castle, an enormous 16th century stone structure, tall, foreboding towers, lined with menacing gargoyles, pierce the night sky. The castle appears deserted. Its interior is completely dark, save for a small flickering candlelight. It burns from the castle's upstairs window. Indiana gives a questioning look to McGowan. The inspector points to the castle's upstairs window. That light only burns after a murder has been committed. Let's go. The villagers step back, eyes wide with fear. Murmurs of ain't going in there, nor I. Got me a wife and kids. I don't know why they're southern in Scotland, but here you go. Are heard from the terrified <laughs> villagers. Indiana turns to McGowan. Even the usually sturdy inspector is trembling. But McGowan turns to his men, forcing himself to be strong. And for this speech he is uh bill paxton oh from independence day <laughs> bill pullman bill pull yeah you're right i fucked oh it up my God. <laughs> you're the worst okay yeah <laughs> well uh, that is what we're here for and then uh hennessy galbraith 
battling. You're coming with us because it's Independence Day. <laughs> it's almost Crispin Glover. I love him. As each man is called, oh <laughs> the color leaves his face. The chosen policemen reluctantly join the inspector and Indiana as they begin walking towards the castle. The remaining villagers and policemen stay behind, waiting. The elderly woman kisses the crucifix that hangs from her neck. She stares at the parting men. The elderly woman is, I believe, Cheryl Lasley, and you are a extremely old lady who's really got a poop. Oh, oh my God, help me <laughs> The castle doors. Two enormous wooden doors covered with intricate carvings of demons, serpents, and gar gargoyles adorn the castle entrance. Indy and the police stand before the doors. Indy glances at the upstairs window. A candle still flickers. A long wooden bar carved in the shape of a ser serpent is fastened through the metal door latches. It blocks the castle entrance. Indy and the policeman grab hold of the bar. Indy clutches the rusty metal door handles and he pulls hard. The doors creak, groan, and slowly open. A thick cloud of dust explodes from inside the castle. It blows out all the torches. Behind the open doors, there is total darkness. Indiana enters, holding the flashlight before him. The policemen exchange frightened glances. Inspector McGowan shoves them through the open doors. Interior castle. Indy's flashlight beam gazes over the castle's interior. It is a stone palace filled with elaborate antique furnishings, macabre sculptures, and oil paintings. The place is bathed in dust. Thick cobwebs fill every corner. It is extremely cold. The men's breaths are visible. Hennessy rubs his folded arms, and Hennessy is... Oh, so you are... I'm going to tell you right now. John, you are Hennessy... Galbraith and Bottomley, all the police officers, and you will play them as three different Bond characters. One will be Sean Connery, one will be Pierce Brosnan, and one will be Daniel Craig. <laughs> you are not prepared for any of this, and I love you for it. It's deathly cold in here. How could a human being survive? Hearing this, the other policemen exchange terrified glances. Indiana shines his flashlight to a twisting stone staircase. The staircase spirals upward along a far wall, leading to the second floor. A faint glimmer of light emanates from the top of the stairs. Indy moves forward. The policemen follow. He ascends the stairs, slowly, silently, towards the light. McGowan and the others are directly behind him. As he makes his way to the top, Indy examines the bizarre oil paintings that line the wall. There are various portraits and landscapes depicting everything from military battles to Sunday picnics, but the unsettling quality of the pictures is that they each feature the same white-haired elderly man. Indy comments to Mac, and from this point forward, Indy will be... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, Indy will be Peter Griffin, because it makes me happy, and mm -hmm. McGowan will be uh, J. Jonah Jameson. This guy's got one hell of an ego. Baron Seamus Seagrove III. Some say uh, he walks the more every midnight. Other people say, bring me pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> Others claim he's been dead for years. Ah, it's weird that Chris wrote that line, but it's in there, man. It's in there. Uh, Indy <laughs> arrives at the top of the stairs. His hand rests on a sculpture that is part of the banister. The sculpture is a bust of Baron Seagrove. Indiana makes his way to the first doorway, where the light emanates. The door is wide open. A thick cobweb covers the entrance, and the policemen follow. The bedroom, deserted, except for a few pieces of elaborate anti antique furniture and a large canopy bed. Everything in the room is caked with dust and cobwebs, save for the burning candle. It's the... It rests on the windowsill in a sparkling, sterling silver holder. It bathes the room in orange light. Indiana walks towards the candle, arm outstretched. He prepares to lift it. The policemen watch, shivering, silent, tightly gripping their pistols. Indy's fingers are inches from the candlestick. Suddenly, there's a loud whoosh! Whoosh. There it is, yeah, the candle goes out. Indy drops his flashlight. There is a to there's total darkness. We hear the distant, maniacal laugh of a man. And FYI, you are Baron Seagrove, Brock. So I'm gonna get a maniacal laugh from you. And Baron Seagrove... Uh, is going to be Captain Hook. Amazing. Okay. Uh, so good, I lost my place. 
Here we go. Uh, he looks, McGowan looks at his men. A troubled, or troubled, because it's horribly misspelled in here, looks over the inspector's face. McGowan's eyes dart around the room. Hennessy is gone. And am Hens I still, who, who am I right? I mean, I'm McGowan. You're still uh, J, J. Jonah Jameson for the moment. Okay, great. <clears throat> Hennessy. Uh, Hennessy. He was standing right here. Just a second ago, standing right beside me. The sound or sound of a bell. FYI, sorry, I didn't mention this at the beginning. Uh, I do have a link in the description if you want to download the script. I'm sorry I didn't mention that before, but you can download the script and read all of these ridiculous typos along with us. But S O O N D is the sound of a bell. Uh, a thick, dull ringing in the distance. It sends a chill through the men. Indiana darts out the room, following the sound. The policemen are right behind him. Interior castle, Indy and the policemen hurry down the stairs. The ringing bell continues. McGowan is calling for Hennessy. Indy dashes to the door along for the far wall. He opens it. It leads into a dark basement. The sound of the ringing bell echoes from inside. Indy enters, motioning for others to follow. Interior basement. McGowan leans to his side, calling for Hennessy. McGowan's weight causes the rotted banister to snap in two. He loses his footing, falling off the side of the stairs. Indy's, Indiana's arm shoots out, grabbing hold of McGowan's collar. Indy pulls McGowan back to safety. McGowan catches his breath, shaking, and McGowan is now uh, Jesse, the body of Ventura, and Indiana is uh, my kid voice from all the big head videos. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh. Thank you for catching me, Indiana Jones, in your very tender grip. <laughs> I'd rather be catching trout. <laughs> they continue down the stairs, arrive for Fing at the, uh, at the bottom. It is a large, musty stone basement. The slimy walls are covered with green moss. There are several doors along the basement wall. The sound of a ringing bell is much louder now. Indy moves to the first door. He reaches for the handle. The policemen draw their pistols. Indy opens the door, and a large object shoots out from inside, rolling towards the men. The policemen fire their guns. Several shots ring out. The object comes to a stop. A deep red liquid pours onto the floor. Indy dips his finger into the liquid. He tastes. Still good. Interesting blood type! The policemen stare, wide-eyed. Indy smiles. Cabernet Sauvignon! 1897! Indy's no. flashlight beam <laughs> signs, signs, shines ahead, illuminating the mysterious object. A wine barrel, and inside the room is a deserted wine cellar. Suddenly, a loud creak echoes through the basement. Galbraith cries out. Look. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone turns at that very subtle look. I love it. A large stone door built into the wall slowly opens. Indy and policemen stare in amazement. The door stops wide open. A flickering light glimmers from inside. Indiana walks to the opening. He peers into the opening. And the policemen stay a few steps back. Behind the door is a family crypt. All kinds of shit is in there. Moving on. We see that there's... <laughs> <laughs> we see a uh, frightening, familiar face in a death mask. It's Baron Seagrove. Camera dollies to the far corner of the crypt. It stops on a close-up of the candlestick. The, ex the exact candle from upstairs still burning. It rests on one of the coffin's glass tops. A trembling McGowan steps back away from the crypt. He blurts an order to his men. Camera, you come with me. We'll search for Hennessy. And also the person. Out here. Bottomly, you go with Dr. Jones. And there. McGowan and Galbraith nearly fall all, all over each other as they scramble away from the crypt. The two dash off into another section of the basement. Indy shakes his head. He enters the script. The script. Yeah, he enters the crypt. Uh, a reluctant and very frightened Bottomly follows. Indy's flashlight beam dances across the glass coffin tops. Decayed corpses smile from inside, their hands tightly clutching crucifixes. Bottomly is horrified by the grim grinning ghosts who have come out to socialize. No, uh, Indiana continues ahead. He passes the burning candle, moving forward into the darkness of the crypt. The shivering Bottomly stays directly behind Indy with their every step. The bell's ringing gets louder and louder. Indy and Bottomly arrive in a circular chamber located at the far end of the crypt. 
Here, the ringing bell is nearly deafening. The sound echoes from above. We are on the floor of the bell tower. Indiana shines his flashlight upward. The beam stops on a ringing bell that hangs several feet in the air. Inside of the bell, dangling by his feet, is the dead body of Hennessy. He has been re he has replaced the bell clapper. And he has become a dong. His body swings back and forth. It slams into the sides of the bell, causing the dull ringing. Bottomly screams. Indiana grabs Bottomly's arm. Let's get out of here! <laughs> Indy and Bottomley turn to the crypt door, begins to close. The two men dash forward. The door continues to close. Indy and Bottomley are only inches away. When the door slams shut, they push and kick at the door. No good. It won't budge. A panicked Bottomley calls for help. Inspector McGowan, Galbraith, open the door! Using his flashlight, Indy scans the door, looking for a crack. Another way out, Indy, there isn't one, but Indy nudges Bottomley. I need more light! Bottomly hurries to the candle. He reaches out. There's a loud whoosh. The candle flame goes out, followed by total darkness. Indy turns from the door. Bottomly? No answer. Indy shines his flashlight toward the area. The candle is gone. There is no sign of Bottomly. Indiana takes a step forward. Bottomly? Again, no answer. Indy sweeps the <laughs> flashlight from room to room, and he shoots back. Indy is met with a shocking sight. Bottomly lies inside the coffin. He's dead, his face twisted in a ghoulish smile, as if he watched that videotape from that movie. All his bones are broken. His hands are wrapped around a crucifix. Sure, why not? Indy stares in horror. There is a sound, footsteps. There is someone in here. Indy's flashlight beam darts around the crypt. There is no sign of anyone. Who is it? Who's there? Oh, he's going through puberty. I like it. The same <laughs> crazed laugh of a man echoes through the crypt. Crazed laugh, ah, Doc. It's me, the laugh of Hans Conrad. Ah, 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 ah. A chilled Indy turns back to the door. Who wouldn't be chilled by such a laugh? He is startled to find the crypt door covered with a thin sheet of ice. Indy reaches out. He touches the sparkling green ice. He snaps back his hand. His fingers are burnt. Interior basement. McGowan and Galbraith are outside of the crypt door. They pull at the door's metal handles, trying to open it up, but the door won't move. McGowan calls through the door, and both of you are Bernie Sanders. Dr. Jones, try to push Democratic <laughs> Socialist agenda. Interior crypt. Indy answers, taking a step back. I can't. There's some kind of hot ice covering the... Uh... Indy suddenly falls into an action gauntlet. It's about damn time. Uh, uh, so here we go. I am about to read this dialogue, and Megan is going to... Uh, you're going to actually just prompt me for new voices from time to time. So what voice am I starting with, Megan? Uh, you're going to start with the priest from Princess Bride. Oh, I don't know if I'm confusing him with the... Is that Mowage? Yes, Great. that is Mowage. <laughs> The floor has disappeared from beneath him. Indy manages to grab hold of a stone coffin. His fingers twitely grip the coffin's edge. Indiana looks down. Beneath him is several hundred foot drop into total darkness. Indy tries to pull himself up. The coffin's ancient stone begins to crumble. Large chunks and pieces fall from Indy's grasp. He is losing his grip. Seconds before he plummets into the abyss, Indy reaches inside the coffin. He clutches onto a corpse arm. Using the arm, Indy swings downward. <laughs> Interior abyss. You can make me keep going with this one, all right. You said you were gonna cue me, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're, you're cueing me because I can't cue myself. Okay, well now you're either Rick or Morty. I'm Rick or Morty? Oh, great. Oh, jeez. Okay, uh, at the precise moment, uh, Indy releases the, the dead arm. He lands on a, on a rocky ledge uh, located only a, a few feet below the, uh, the open crypt door. And uh, Indy, he, he stands on the ledge, safe. He, he smiles, relieved. Suddenly, the ledge snaps. Indy, uh, 
<laughs> India falls. His brr, uh, oh god, my Morty, uh, Rick is terrible. Uh, his body drops hundreds of feet into the into the blackness. Uh, oh god, Morty, uh, moment, Morty, Morty, a moment passes. Not a Morty passes. Uh, then we hear a splash, and we're at the bottom of the hole. <laughs> and at the bottom of the hole, uh, you now sound like a dog-human hybrid who just ate one too many falafels. <laughs> I love you, chat room. <laughs> Uh, a pool of water uh, surrounded by, by uh, rocky, cavernous walls. Uh, oh my god, in, you sound like Julia Child's in his, <laughs> Indiana's hat floats on the, on the water's surface. Uh, Indy pops out of the water, uh, bobbing, 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 uh, beside the hat. India reaches for the, for the hat. Uh, 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 suddenly, a uh, uh, fish flaps out of the water. Uh, uh, or, or the fish gobbles up one of the one of the hats for large breaks and disappears back underwater. Indy, he smirks. Now they bite. And now you sound like Venom. We, uh, Indy attempts to pull himself out of the water. There is a loud sound, grinding metal, rattling chains. Indy's eyes dart to his side. Two horizontal metal gates eject from the cavern walls. They shoot across the water like webbing, like lightning, actually. They're, they're headed towards each other and Indy's head. Indy dives underwater. The gates snap shut less than an inch above the water's surface. Indy attempts to resurface. The closed gate stops him. He clutches the grating, moving, trying to move its gate. It's too strong. Indy struggles for air, no good. There is no space. He is going to drown, and so are we. Oh, Jesus. And now you sound like Roger Rabbit. Ho! Oh, uh, uh, underwater, in a <laughs> desperation, Eddie, please. Indy swims downward, looking for an altern alternate escape, but there's no bottom in sight. Uh, Indy's eyes bulge, just like, boo! His, his face loses color. Only a few precious seconds of life remain when suddenly he, he spots something. A, a small tunnel. Oh, built into the cabin wall. Indiana hurriedly swims to the tunnel. He bolts inside. It's a water fountain. Oh, it's a three-tiered stone structure. Oh, man, that's neat. Inside, instead, the familiar color. You know what? Give me a second, let me say the actual freaking words. The camera dollies to a large metal drain located inside of the fountain's base. The drain cover begins to turn, suddenly flipping open. Indiana crawls out of the opening. He gulps, and his air color returns to his face. Life returns to his body. Indy rises to his feet, and he finds himself standing in the fountain. And you're gonna finish off by being a 40s fast-talking news reporter. <laughs> Uh, he is here inside a banquet room. The sprawling room is beautifully decorated in Victorian dignity. The room is immaculate, not one speck of dust. Two medieval suits of armor adorn one wall. A, gra a gargantuan crystal chandelier hangs above a long mahogany banquet table. At the end of the table sits a shriveled, white-haired elderly man. Uh, it is Baron Seamus Seagrove the third, the fellow whose likeness appeared in every piece of artwork. Baron Seagrove is calmly eating his dinner. A bloated, roasted pig rests on a silver platter before him. The same candle he saw burning in the upstairs room and the family crypt now rests on the table, directly beside the Baron. Two powerful, muscular mastiffs are tied to Baron Seagrove's chair. Teeth bared, eyes ablaze. The hounds fight for a scrap of meat. Indiana stares in bewilderment at the new surroundings. He steps out of the fountain. Baron Seagrove seems unaware of Indy's presence. Indiana walks towards the Baron, and he's got a normal damn voice, because we just heard too many voices. Okay. End of action gauntlet one. <laughs> this is what you all have to look forward to now. I love you all. Excuse me, sir. Hello. Baron Seagrove does not look up from his plate. Indy moves closer. He speaks louder. Can you hear me? Close up beneath the table, Baron Seagrove's hand nonchalantly unties the Mastiff's bindings. 
Indiana still walks towards the table. The Baron continues to ignore him. Indy is annoyed. Listen, pal. There are two dead policemen upstairs, and... The Mastiffs leap forward, coming at Indy. He tries to get away. Too slow, the hounds are upon him, tearing, clawing, biting. They drag Indy to the floor. Baron Seagrove continues to enjoy his dinner, seemingly oblivious to the scene before him. Indiana fights for his life. The vicious dogs tear at his clothing and skin. Indy spots something on the wall above. Hanging amidst a display of stuffed animal heads is a hunter's trumpet. Indy struggles uh, to his knees, trying to reach for the horn. But the dogs are still biting, clawing, weakening Indy. Indy's fingers are inches from the horn. The Mastiff's sharp claws rip at his arm, but Indy manages to snatch the trumpet. He quickly moves to the horn, moves the horn to his lip. He blows hard. A high piercing note fills the air. The dogs <laughs> respond to the sound. <laughs> they halt, stopping their attacks for a moment. Tattered and bruised, Indiana leaps to his feet. He drops the horn and any chance of winning Robin Shabatsky's heart. Uh, he runs. That was a deep cut. Uh, the Mastiffs come to their senses. They dart after Indy, mouths foaming. Baron Seagrove continues to dine, still ignoring the action. Indy runs to a velvet curtain. He grabs hold of a long, thick rope that is attached to the curtain. Indy tears the curtain from the wall. A large stained glass window is behind it. The first Mastiff leaps at Indy. Indiana quickly drapes the curtain over the hound. Indy ties a large knot in the open curtain end and the dog is trapped. Indy turns. The second Mastiff is only a few feet away, barreling towards Indy. Indiana hops to the window ledge. He opens the window. The Mastiff leaps upward. Indiana jumps out the window. The dog follows Indy, also jumping out the window. The Mastiff falls, flying hundreds of feet into the rocky waters below. The hound's vicious howl fades. Camera pans from the water and stops on Indiana Jones. Indy has outsmarted the Mastiff. He hangs uh, the swinging. He hangs from the swinging door frame, safe. He leaps back inside the room. Baron Seagrove pours himself a glass of wine. A very angry Indiana Jones walks towards the Baron, and a good angry voice for Indy will be uh, Batman. Christian Bale, Batman. Christian Bale, Batman. Showtime's over, mister. You better start talking. The Baron still ignores Indy. There's a lot of strange things happening around here. A suit of armor located a few feet behind Indy suddenly twitches. Its arm lowers. Its head slowly turns. Indiana still walk, walks towards the Baron, who is only concerned with spreading butter on his bread. Indy shouts. And I want some answers! Do you hear me? I want some answers now. And we have now entered another action gauntlet. And this one is for Isaac, because he's been sitting there so quietly, so patiently, till his character enters. So Isaac, you are going to be reading uh, from this point, uh, basically to the line where Indiana says, have you had enough on page 13? So just okay. so you're aware of kind of where you're where you're going. And I will be calling new voice this time when I think it's time to switch out voices. And Megan will be saying the voices. So chat room, here it is. Let's make Isaac work for it. <laughs> Good man. Begin. Uh, sorry, let me get a voice first. Sorry. I will, I will start easy. There was a Isaac specific request to do Crush. Crush okay. from Finding Nemo. <laughs> Oh, well, dude, there is like a loud creak of metal. A huge, sharp battle axe shoots into frame, <laughs> swinging towards Indy's head. Indy, like, spins, and the axe is only inches from his face. Whoa, dude! Indy leaps back. Whoosh. The axe slices through the air, just missing Indy. The shaken Indiana is shocked to see, oh, dude, a glistening black suit of armor. The Black Knight is nearly seven feet tall, man. It has come to life and is walking toward Indy. The Black Knight is wildly swinging the battle axe. Indiana continues to step back. Back. Unbeknownst to Indy, his steps are leading him toward... No, no new voice. Suit of armor. New voice. Mario! Mario! Woohoo! Also over seven feet tall, this armor is made of a silvery white metal. As Indy moves closer, ring! The White Knight opens its arms. When Indy is within reach, the White Knight locks its powerful arms around Indy's chest. Oh no! 
It seems Indy tries to break free. No good. The White Knight's grip is too tight. Indy is trapped, trapped. The Black Knight still comes toward Indy. It's frenzied. Axe swings back and forth and back and forth. Indy still struggles with the White Knight's bone crunching grip. New voice. Jar Jar Banks, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, boy. Oh, no. <laughs> his favorite character. The Black Knight is only a few feet from Indy. It's deadly axe blade inches from Indy's face. Oh, no, sir. Indy animal moves fast. He jerks his body forward, then flips the White Knight off its feet, over Indy's head. The White Knight flies into the Black Knight. This sends both knights falling to the floor. Oh, Indiana shoots to his feet. The two knights leap to their feet. They chase Indy, the black knight's arm with its axe, the white knight arm with a long, sharp sword. No, Indy! A new voice. <laughs> Pardon my ignorance. I had a Shadow the Hedgehog. Is that different from Sonic? Yes. Or was that a typo? Shadow the Hedgehog. Okay. Go. Yeah. Baron Seagrove spoons another helping of boiled potatoes onto his plate. Indy snatches a shield and sword from a nearby wall display, ready to fight. The knights are upon him. Indiana battles both knights. He defends the bludgeoning battle axe with his shield and sword fights the other knight. Thrash! Clang! The sound of heavy metal fills the room. Indy's sword strikes the white knight's thick chest. The sword snaps in two. In the confusion, Indy's shield is knocked from his hand by the powerful battle axe. Indy is defenseless. The two metal giants raise their weapons high, aiming for Indy's head. The two knights swing. Indy dives to the floor. The knights can't stop their weapons in time. Crunch! They deliver a hard blow to each other. The woozy knights wobble and spin. In a momentary daze, Indiana jumps to his feet. And new voice. Gomez Adams. Ah, oh, yes. The black knight hisses, furious. He dashes after Indiana. The white knight is still reeling from the blow. Seeing the black knight in hot pursuit, Indy searches for a weapon. He spots the curtain's long, thick rope lying on the floor. The black knight is nearly upon Indy, axe raised. Indiana grabs the rope. He spins, facing the knight. Indy snaps his wrist. A loud crack. The rope shoots forward. Not unlike Indiana's familiar whip. The rope wraps itself around the black knight's neck. Indy jerks the whip forward hard. This sends the knight flying through the air. The knight crashes into the stone fountain. Several of the fountain sculptors shatter into pieces. The dazed, dented black knight attempts to stand, but losing his footing, the knight falls backwards into the fountain wide drain opening. Its heavy armor causes the knight to sink, disappearing into the hole, into the pool of water. All right, new voice. Anakin Skywalker? Little kid or grown up? Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> Whichever you'd like. Oh, well, Indy catches his breath. The white knight sword swings in the frame, slicing through Indiana's jacket. Indy jumps back. The white vicious knight comes toward him. Indiana turns to run, finding himself at the banquet table, face to face with the roasted pig. A few feet away, Baron Seagrove continues to dine. The white knight raises his sword above Indy. Whoosh! The sword begins to swing down. Indiana ducks and dodges the deadly blows. Instead of carving Indiana, the knight's sword manages to slice its perfect sections of the roasted pig. The satisfied baron helps himself to a freshly carved slice of pork. Indiana leaps onto the tabletop. All right. And let's, uh, let's go get another new voice here. Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> All right, look. Trying to escape the living suit of armor, but the white knight climbs upon the table, the dinner table. Look, follow instructions, following Indy. The sword slashing knight pursues Indy along the tabletop, not near the dessert forks, all right? Indy glances upward toward the heavy chandelier. Indy smiles, a plan. He continues to step backward, leading the knight directly below the chandelier. At the precise moment, Indy picks up a sterling silver plate. A sterling silver, remember that. From the tabletop, Indy whisks the plate into the air toward the rope that holds the chandelier. The spinning plate severs the rope. The chandelier flies downward, crashing on top of the white knight. The knight lies beneath the chandelier, motionless. The sword drops its lifeless hand onto the tabletop. 
Indy takes the knight's sword, eyes on fire, sword outstretched. Indiana walks across the tabletop, headed for Baron Seagrove. The Baron prepares to take another bite of his food, deliciously prepared by yours truly. The sword shoots into frame, and the tip of the blade rests upon Baron Seagrove's rubbery throat. Indiana snarls. And he's still Batman. Great job, Isaac. <laughs> Just a little bit of applause for that. Well done. That was uh, amazing. That was our second action gauntlet. The chat there. loved that. We've got it. We've got a, uh, a break on those for a little bit. So back to the story. All right. <laughs> Great job, man. Haven't you had enough? Baron Seagrove finally looks at Indiana. The Baron lowers his fork. His face twists into an eerie grin, and he begins laughing. Ah! 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 ah, ah fork in my throat! Ah! It's the same maniacal laugh we heard earlier. Indy ah, responds by hope. <laughs> Indy responds by blowing out the flame of the mysterious candle. The room's door bursts open. Inspector McGowan and Galbraith dash inside. They hurry to Baron Seagrove. Their pistols aimed at Galbraith's, uh, their pistol aimed at him. Galbraith handcuffs the Baron. McGowan looks at the bruised, bloodied, and tattered Indiana Jones. And for this, your voices now are McGowan. Oh, let's go ahead and do, uh, Winnie the Pooh and, uh, let's get Stewie in there. Winnie the Pooh and Stewie. Stewie. Mm -hmm. Which one am I doing? I'm You're sorry. Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. I know. Okay. Oh, now you can get back to your fishing, Dr. Jones. Or maybe you could play a game of pool sticks. No chance, Mac. My plane leaves in the morning. Vacation's over. Gotta get back to school. Oh, tis a shame to go home empty-handed. I uh, tell you what, friend, I fancy myself quite the fisher bear. Tomorrow, I'll go out and catch you a real heffalump and woozle. Right. Send it to me, ML. Dr. Jones, McGowan's word is truer than high. Yes, yes, yes. Nature's <laughs> kiss. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, they exit the room, exterior castle. The villagers surround the castle. Their bright torches are raised high in the air. Baron Seagrove is led out of the castle by Indiana and the police. The crowd begins to whisper, anxious, excited, as the Baron is led to the police vehicle. He turns and looks at Indy. The Baron speaks in a trembling, raspy voice. His eyes are wild, and he is... Uh, still, you know what, Captain Hook, finish it off. You had the laugh, say some words. No jail can hold me. All right, Peter Pan, maybe a crocodile, but aside from that, <laughs> no. And look at that, he would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for that meddling archeologist. A chill rushes through the Indiana. The Baron turns, continuing to the police wagon. One of the villagers shouts, and that villager is voiced by Shara Lasley, and she is Tiny Tim. Oh, no. Oh, I, <laughs> he's done it! Indiana Jones has captured the killer! That was amazing. So much so that I tapped on the wrong part of my page here. Here we go. Uh, God bless us, everyone. The, child, the crowd cheers, and Indiana gives a humble Please. nod and wave. McGowan shakes Indy's hand. Indy glances to the police vehicle. Indy's POV, Baron Seagrove climbs into the back compartment of the police vehicle. Galbraith closes the vehicle doors. The Baron is still visible through the vehicle's windows. He lights a cigarette. It appears that the match flame shines through the Baron's body. It's as if he were a ghost. Ooh. Indiana Ooh. turns to the others, eyes wide, shocked. But it is obvious that no one else has seen the apparition. McGowan notices the pale expression on Indiana's face. Uh, yeah, you know what? Finish up as uh, Jesse Ventura and uh, uh, Herbert. We were doing all the family things. For Herbert for Family Guy. Well, what is it, man? You look as if you've seen a reptilian militia member. Indy points back to the police uh, vehicle, but it has already departed. It drives over a far hill, disappearing into the night. Indy sighs, turning back to McGowan. 
Oh, it was nothing, Mac. Definitely not a much love. People boy bringing me some good news. <laughs> nothing at all. Camera dollies into Indy's troubled, uncertain face. The Baron's laugh fills the soundtrack. Slow dissolve. And that's the cold open! That's how the movie starts! Oh my <laughs> what? god. With a ghost adventure. A Scooby-Doo ghost adventure with Indiana Jones. Now we can get to the Monkey King. Oh, okay. But you know. That was 16 minutes. That would have been 16 minutes of screen time for that. <laughs> All right. We got this, people. We are plowing through this here. Uh, amazing. And like any good Indiana Jones movie, once you have your cold open, well, you got to go back to the university. Exterior, Marshall University, a few days later. Early afternoon, a rainy spring day. Students run the university. Uh, run to the university doors, protecting themselves with textbooks. Interior, Indiana Jones's office. Rain splatters the window of the cramped, cluttered room. Crooked stacks of dog-eared textbooks and papers nearly reach the ceiling. The spindly bookshelves, it's a mess. It, fine, I'm not reading that. You, <laughs> to make matters worse, the office is crowded with students. Uh, with countless others pouring out into the hallway. All of the students are anxious to get inside. They are badgering, complaining, and moaning, and, and there's a bunch of them, so here are your voices, people. All right, so, Teddy. Uh, Teddy, you, uh, John, and you are gonna be Dobby the Elf from Harry Potter. And Dee Dee, you are Angela. You will be Too High Terry, that character that you sent me. I don't know what that is, but we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> Virgil is John, <laughs> and you will be SpongeBob SquarePants. And Dee Dee, you are also Julia, who is a pirate. Um, but let's have her be a pirate with a secret. <laughs> all right. Um, oh, it's all right. And Brock, you are Charles, and Charles is slowly turning into a werewolf. Uh, here you go. Now we've got these five lines. Dr. Jones. Took your class instead of all the others. I, I, I could have had Professor Needles, Professor Eisenschmidt. Oh, uh, pr pr Professor, Professor, no, oh. no, Brad Jobby. Oh, Brad Jobby. oh, man, oh, man, <laughs> you promised, man. You said you would have graded by yesterday. Wait, what's today? <laughs> um, my paper finished yet? Name's Virgil Vector. That's Virgil. Spelling it out for everyone. I am capital V I R. My parents paid good money to send me here. <laughs> it's on the next page. You know how much they shelled out for your class? <laughs> Indiana continues to grade papers, trying to ignore the verbal assault. Betsy Tuffet rushes her way to the front. Betsy is Indy's student assistant. She is 21 years old, with thick, luxurious black hair, bright brown eyes, and a small, framed, athletic body. Betsy is a tough, brash, a, a Brooklyn kid. She moves close to Indy, her hair brushing her cheek. Indy, oh, brushing his cheek. Uh, Indiana is very tense, continuously working on the term papers, and you'll be normal voices for this first scene. Hello, and <laughs> Dr. Jones. Not now, Betsy. Look at all those papers. Please, I... <laughs> Want me to come by later? Help you grade? Help me grade. Yeah, sure. Goodbye, and... <laughs> Dr. Jones. She exits in size again, the obnoxious student shouts. I feel like you didn't hear me the first time, so I will repeat yet again. Virgil, capital B, I, I. Professor Thad Priestley enters, pushing Virgil aside. Priestley is a young, wisecracking, greasy-haired acquaintance of Indy's. He shoves a photograph be beneath Indy's nose, and Priestley is... Uh... Voiced by, uh, you know what, Isaac. 
you do that one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swap that one out. Uh, Isaac, can you do Robert Shaw from Jaws? His speech? Sure. Yeah. That's, oh, I, that's him. I don't know the you don't have to I do a speech. I'm just saying that I'm, that's I'm the character. Moby Dick. Ah. That's what I named him. Captain said it was the biggest fish he ever saw. Indiana glances at the photo. It's a picture of Professor Priestley uh, dressed in fisherman's outfit, standing on a pier holding a giant fish. Indy steams. Uh, Priestley gives him a manly slap on the back and wait. Uh, Ted, can you do a Richard Dreyfus? Richard Dreyfus. That's fine. I'll <laughs> That's do it. Pretty much it. Do it. <laughs> Continue. What about you, Jonesy? You were over in Scotland for two weeks. Did you catch the big one? Look, Priestley, I, I'm real busy. <laughs> <laughs> Stabby Dunk, Ted. <laughs> Spot on. Oh, I can, I can hear your your opus all right indy yeah. is suddenly interrupted by a hard slap on his face he looks up a beautiful blonde student rebecca stands over his desk she screams furious and rebecca is jimmy stewart oh oh you two-timing bastard <laughs> indiana rubs his jaw startled rebecca continues oh how could you my own mother and my own bed. I've had it with you. It's over. Oh, Mary. <laughs> Priestley hides his chuckle. Rebecca throws a shirt that obviously belongs to Indiana on the desk and storms out of the room. Indy shakes his head and continues working. The students are still harassing him. A loud voice echoes through the room, which is a po postman who is Brock Powell. And, oh, I'm going to swap that because we already did that one. And uh, the postman is God, I've got so many wonderful choices. Droopy, sorry, Droopy Dog. <clears throat> Special delivery for uh, Dr. Jones. A burly postman <laughs> stands in the doorway <laughs> sounding like that, holding a thick, enormous brown envelope. Indy motions to the postman. Uh, he makes his way through the crowd. And Indy goes back to his grading, but is suddenly interrupted by a loud tapping noise. He looks up. Dean Claude Coventry, a stately elderly gentleman, wraps a steel ruler on Indiana's desk. The Dean is upset and very serious. And the Dean is voiced by Isaac, and I want him to be a disgruntled police chief from an 80s cop movie. <laughs> and uh, Indiana, you are... Uh, Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Dr. Jones, I've actually to several of his students. The postman interrupts, dropping the heavy envelope onto Indy's desk. The postman shoves a yellow paper in front of Indy. Sign here, sir. Indy signs. Dean Coventry continues lecturing. They feel that you are ignoring them, that you are distracted. Me distracted. <laughs> what is this, sir? A, a B plus? Is that how you sign your name? Indy grabs sir? the paper. He signed a B plus on the line where his name is supposed to appear. Indy crosses out the grade and signs his name. Professor Coventry still lectures Indiana. Look, Marshall University is not the place for the sloppy behavior. <laughs> Indy opens the envelope, and a large amount of water pours out, saturating the papers on the desk. This is followed by enormous dead trout. It flops onto Indy's desk. The students exchange startled and nauseous glances. Uh, Indiana removes a waterlogged note from the envelope. It reads, in McGowan's voice, A McGowan's word is truer than an angel's girl. Indiana uses a tissue to wipe some of the water from his desk. Dean Coventry shakes a finger at Indy. I have one final warning for you, Dr. Jones. The phone rings, interrupting the Dean. Indiana quickly Ring. answers the phone. A, a fuming Dean Coventry impatiently waits to finish his threat. Indiana speaks into the receiver. Yeah. Oh, hello, Marcus. Hello, can you all hang? You were saying, sir? Either you begin concentrating on your... Yeah, Marcus. 
I'm still here. Just hold on. I'm very sorry, sir. Ooh, concentrating on your teeth and do what is all. Damn it, Marcus. I'm just standing here with Dean. What? Just how important? It is, huh? Okay. Five minutes. Yeah, I'll be right over. But this better be important, Marcus. And he hangs up. He gives an embarrassed look to the furious red faced Dean. You are on probation, Jones. Ten days. If there's no improvement, you will be dismissed. The dean storms out of the room. Indy gathers the wet papers. He begins to exit the room, explaining to the students as he makes his way through the crowd. Hey, I, I promise by tomorrow, I've all these graded and dried. Indiana continues making apologies and excuses. The obnoxious student again shouts at him. Virgil Vector, capital V, I, R, F. Oh, Virgil stares at his paper, adorned with a large red F. Indiana exits the room. They are going to call that into question at the board. All right, the large room. So he's now at the History Museum, and it's full of a bunch of skeletons and History Museum stuff, including a Tyranniosaurus Rex statue, as the spelling says. And now we've got uh, Indiana and Marcus. And Marcus Brody is Mr. John, and you will be Obi-Wan Kenobi, and... So will Indiana Jones. <laughs> this better be important, Marcus, or the museum will soon be displaying my bones. My teaching career is in danger of extinction. Wow. You will not be disappointed, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to a close-up of an ancient painting. The watercolor features an upright, wrinkled face. Sun Wu Kung the stone monkey king, but the monkey is not made of stone. He appears to be half human, half monkey. His face is wise. His coal black eyes are penetrating. He wears a lion skin robe and holds a tall golden hooped staff. Sun Wound King stands amidst, uh, uh, bloop, bloop, sorry, uh, ripe, some ripe peach, peach trees. He is surrounded by a heavenly glow, a bright ray of light that emanates from an opening in the clouds. Look familiar. Camera pulls back. We are inside of the museum boardroom. Marcus holds the tattered painting before Indiana, who sits at a desk, still feverishly grading the wet term papers. After he finishes each paper, Indy pins it to a nearby bulletin board for drying. He glances to the painting of Sun Wukong. Sun Wukong. Sun Wukong. The stone monkey king. Big deal. That was ten years ago, Marcus. Jeez, this hella kid's got the worst grammar. Ten years. Or 50 years. It will always be in your blood. Don't believe this. He spells repeat with two E's. Think back, Indiana. Remember your desire, your passion. Kid still gets an A on content, a D on form. Damn it, man. You can't bury those feelings forever. Reach out to them, feel them. Yeah, it's weird. Obi-Wan doesn't get mad. <laughs> Indiana finally looks up from the papers. He glances at Marcus, then looks at the painting. Camera dollies into Indiana's face. He becomes very serious, somber. His eyes are empty. Memories of failure fill his head. And now for this part of the scene, Ted Evans will be... I'm going to try this for a little bit and see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> Buffalo Bill from uh, Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> and... Uh, How's your, uh, how's your Jodie Foster, uh, John? It's as solid as you'd imagine. <laughs> Great. Let's see how this goes. Just see how that goes. Mm, two years, nearly two years of my life looking for the remains of that monkey. A piece of his legendary golden hoop rod. <laughs> sign of lost city. <laughs> Nine men perished on the journey. Rest of us nearly died from starvation, one of the many horrible diseases we discovered. We still came back empty-handed. One mustn't give up so easily, Indiana. Give up? Marcus, we spent 13 months in China. Another seven in India. But none in Africa. There was no proof. Archaeological or anthropological. Indicate that Sun Wukong ever visited Africa. Uh, until now. 
Marcus turns off the room lights. Hey, my papers. Can't you fuck me? <laughs> there it is. Marcus starts the projector as uh, Indy starts taking off his clothes to have sex. No, uh, black and white image flickers on the far wall. We see a pygmy standing in what appears to be a grassy area. The pygmy's name is Tiki. He is adorable, a little over four feet tall. His body is taut, muscular. His long black hair is shaggy. His eyes are wide and bright, almost childlike. His face is cute, impish, covered with a very inquisitive expression. Tiki's energy is boundless. He cannot stop moving. Moving, standing besides, uh, standing beside Tiki is Dr. Claire Clark, 32 years old, a tall, strikingly beautiful woman. She is communicating with Tiki in a sign language, and for this, we are going to be uh, Marcus. Who can do a Mandy Patinkin? Um, <laughs> from what movie? He's it's he's Inigo got Montoya. Anigo Montoya. Yeah, Anigo Montoya. All right, John, you're gonna do Anigo Montoya, and uh, Ted, you are going to be <laughs> Optimus Prime. No, sorry. Actually, be uh, can you be uh, Max the Wiseman from Princess Bride? Miracle Max? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> which one? What is it? I Have fun storming the reason, castle. Billy Crystal. I can, only, I can only think of Wallace Shawn for some reason. You <laughs> could be Wallace Shawn then. Wallace Shawn. Okay. I just want Princess Bride people talking. All right, cool. The woman is Dr. Claire Clark, the famous zoologist. She works in Africa, studying animals in their natural habitat. Very interesting, Marcus. Now, if you'll turn the lights back on. Three weeks ago, Dr. Clark discovered that cute little fellow, Kiki, a pygmy of an unusual race, unrelated to any known African tribe. Marcus, the lights! Dr. Clark believes that Tiki comes from the lost civilization of Sun Wu Kung. Indiana pauses. He stands, walking closer to the flickering image, suddenly interested. What? But how did Miss Doctor Doctor Clark? How did she arrive at such a preposterous hypothesis? The pygmy speaks in a language that has no African origins, but bears a strong resemblance to Chinese. Means nothing. The rivers of Africa have been plagued by various Oriental pirates and scavengers since the 16th century. Not much evidence, Marcus. There is more. It's going Antonio Banderas, and I apologize. That's all. That's cool. Uh, actually, Megan, let's jump to the chat and see two other suggestions for the remainder of this scene. All right. I need a Michael Keaton. You get to choose the circumstances. Uh, okay. Ted's got it. Ted's and, got Michael Keaton. And it, this is a gentleman speaking, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> let's do some Dolly Parton. <laughs> Good luck, John. <laughs> all, on, all my wheelhouse. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> There's more. The pygmy was found wearing an ornamental peach stone around his neck, y'all. Believed to come from Sun Wu Kong's legendary garden of immortal peaches. Marcus, there are countless undiscovered Ameri African tribes, all with various obscure beliefs and practices. One tribe may wear peach stones. Another may wear banana peels. Indiana walks back to his papers. Marcus pauses. Oh, shoot. There is one final bit of evidence. Enlighten me. The pygmy is over 200 years old, darling. Indy adjusts his spectacles. He stares at the black and white image. The cute pygmy appears to be in his mid-20s. He, he walks to the camera, staring at the lens. Tyke examines the camera with curiosity. That's impossible. Oh, shoot. Dr. Clark has done a considerable amount of testing on the pygmy's clothing. His sandals, everything was over 200 years old. He's probably wearing his great-grandfather's stuff. Our camera pans back to the projected image. Tiki begins to unscrew the camera lens. The picture goes out of focus. The film runs out. Marcus turns off the projector and flips on the overhead room lights. Indiana gives Marcus a puzzled look. What is her? What does all of this have to do with me? Well, Dr. Clark wants to mount an expedition, honey, to find the lost city of Sun Wu Kong. She is quite familiar with your reputation. She'd like you to come along. No chance. There will be money involved. 
the museum is willing to fund the expedition. Sorry, Marcus. I burned this bridge. Uh, and then we're going to finish up this scene, and I'll pull from your wheelhouse here, John, because I'm oh, a nice no. man. <laughs> uh, and you're going to be uh, Vincent Price, and yeah. Ted, you will be Stan Lee. And Indiana turns and walks, uh, begins to walk out of the room. Marcus calls him. Indiana? Indiana Marcus. turns. He waves at the papers at Marcus. Marcus, please. I've got to finish these. You've got to finish something more important. You crossed the threshold over a decade ago, and it's been tearing at your insides ever since. My friend. If there is even one iota of truth in Dr. Clark's findings, then you can lift the veil of mystery that has surrounded this Chinese legend for centuries. You may uncover the secrets to a lost civilization and possibly to man's never-ending search for immortality. Indiana stares at the painting of Sun Wukong. Indiana, can you afford to pass up the single most important adventure of your life. Indiana has no answer for Marcus. Indy picks up the painting. A thrilling expression slowly covers Indiana's face. His eyes glimmer, filled with a long lost excitement. The soundtrack music soars everyone together. Da 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 all right, here we are, people. Uh, the papers, uh, we are looking at a stack of papers. The papers are slightly crumpled, stiff, wet. A drop of water hits the papers and the camera pans upward. Betsy Tuffet, Indy's student assistant, sits at the desk, grading the papers. She is crying. Her falling tears soak the papers. We are inside of Indy's apartment later that evening. Indiana stands in the background. He is hurriedly packing his bags. His familiar gun, hat, and whip lie on the bed beside the suitcase. Indy notices that Betsy is crying. He walks to Betsy. Indy puts his arm on Betsy's shoulder, attempting to comfort her. Betsy snaps at Indy, and so this scene is ridiculous, so you just do your normal, your Betsy voice and your Harrison Ford voice, because this is a weird yeah. scene. <laughs> you can't do this to me! Come on, Betsy, relax. You're getting them all wet again. <sighs> just, you can't go away. I mean... Africa is so far away, and, well, I love you, Indy. Thought we agreed this was supposed to be casual. You call what happened last night casual? My dear, a momentary lapse into passion does not a love affair make. Momentary lapse? So that's all I am to you? Betsy shoots to her feet, walking off screen. Betsy, wait! <sighs> Indy sighs. His eye catches one of the term papers. He begins reading, making a few corrections. We see Betsy's hand removes Indy's whip from the bed. Indy continues to correct the papers. Suddenly, there's a creaking noise. Indy turns. His face goes white. He runs off screen. One end of Indiana's whip is attached to an overhead lamp. Camera pans down to the whip. The other end has been formed into a noose around Betsy's neck. She stands on a wooden chair. She kicks away the chair, suddenly gagging. Indiana grabs Betsy in midair. He takes the noose from her neck and places Betsy on the floor. For this one line, Ted, I want you to be uh, uh, Italian. What's the matter with you? You're trying to ruin my whip or what? <laughs> if I can't have you, I don't want to live. Indiana tosses the whip into his suitcase. He pulls up the chair and forces Ted, uh, forces Betsy to be seated. He pours her a tall glass of bourbon. Drink this, you'll feel better. Indiana walks to his suitcase, continuing to pack. His back is to Betsy. She raises the glass to her lips. She pauses, reading a message on the bourbon bottle. It reads, danger, contents flammable. Betsy beams, an idea. She lifts the bottle over her head and begins to douse her body with the liquid. Indiana is busy folding his clothing. Suddenly, we hear the flick of a matchstick. Indiana turns. We see the bourbon-covered Betsy preparing to light her body on fire. 
Indy dashes forward. He blows out the match moments before it sparks Betsy's clothing. Indy shakes Betsy by the shoulders. This is ridiculous. Come on, Betsy, get old of yourself. You're young. There were a lot of other guys, you know. Not any other guys like you. <laughs> that's true, but that's no reason to stop living. Besides, I'm too old for you. By the time you're 75, I'll be, uh, yeah, I'll be disgusting. Indiana turns and finishes his packing. Betsy sighs. She notices an enormous stone African urn. The 150-pound antique sits atop a section of bookshelves. Meanwhile, Indy makes certain his gun is packed. He places the familiar hat on his head and begins to close the suitcase. Close up the African urn. It's wobbling, shaking, moving closer and closer to the edge of the bookshelf. Camera pans to the floor. Betsy lies here, directly below the trembling urn. Betsy shakes the bookshelves, causing the urn to tilt and shiver. The urn is nearly halfway off its edge. If it falls, the urn will crush Betsy's head. Indiana struggles with closing his tightly packed suitcase. The urn falls, headed straight for Betsy. Indiana suddenly grabs the urn in midair, inches before it strikes Betsy. Indiana rests the urn on the floor. He helps Betsy to her feet. Betsy wraps her arms tightly around Indiana. Don't leave me, Indy! Indiana picks up his suitcase and tries to walk to the door, but Betsy's arms are still tightly wrapped around him. Finally, Indy stops. His eyes burn through Betsy, and he says, he's back to his normal voice. Look, you're just a flighty kid. 20 minutes after I walk out this door, you'll have a date with a college Romeo. Two hours from now, you'll be madly in love with him. By tomorrow, you'll forget her I ever existed. Hurt, Betsy removes her arm from Indy. He gives her a quick kiss to the cheek and hurriedly exits. Betsy glares at the closed door. A tough, angry expression covers her face. Never underestimate the determination of a Brooklyn girl, Dr. Jones. And I'm sure Never. that's the last we'll see of this comedy suicide scene. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, Chris Columbus. That is wow, wow, comedy wow. gold. Wow, 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 wow. wow. Uh, great. Uh, we are now on an ocean liner. Uh, we see the silhouette of the ship sailing across the water. A beautiful orange sky fills the background. Indiana Jones stands aboard the ship's desk, uh, deck. It's typical 30s luxury ocean liner filled with vac vacationing tourists. Indy stares into the sunrise. His face is sudden as uh, study and concentration and intensity. And then we get the map of the world. A moving red line traces Indy's journey across the ocean towards Africa. The red line comes to a stop at Mozambique. And we are now in Mozambique. And there's a there's a bunch of shops. There's a lot of things. And it's really interesting. And it's all really great. And I'm just speeding through this description. Because all you really need to know is that there's a loud car horn. And crowds of pedestrians leap out of the way as a rusted yellow Model T barrels through with a word taxi crudely painted on the side door. The car's tires are wobbling and they're loose. Upon seeing the car, Indiana smiles. At uh, the foot, uh, so at the ocean, the, the car stops, okay? The car stops. And Scraggy Briar, Indiana's friend and guide, who we've never met, jumps out of the taxi. Scraggy is a rough, unkempt African man, an elderly fellow with the energy and vitality of youth. His snow white hair and beard are wild, spiked. He, wear, he wears tattered, dirty clothes and that are many sizes too large for his skinny body. Homemade crocodile sandals flop on his feet. Scraggy suddenly breaks into a wild grin. He spots Indiana. Scraggy shoots up the exit ramp, running through the crowd of people. Scraggy stops a few feet in front of Indy. Uh, Scraggy waves his arms. Speaking in a Portuguese accent, Scraggy exclaims. So you may do whatever voice you want to start, Scraggy. Ah, Indy, at last we are reunited. Oh, Kachingo, God of friendship, I thank you for granting my wish. Indy rests Scraggy back into the ramp. Scraggy moves to assist Indy with his luggage. Before picking it up, Scraggy raises his arms over the baggage. Again, he blesses the suitcases. Scraggy then picks up the bags. And since this is an Indiana Scraggy scene, uh, we're going to swap you. Uh, Scraggy, you are Morgan Freeman. And, uh... Guess who you are, Ted? Also uh, Morgan Freeman. Oh, shit. <laughs> I see you haven't changed, Scraggy. Oh, Jackie. God of goodness. Say, before body make contact before an object, one must cast out bad spirits or... 
or bad spirits will enter your body. Why, yes. You have an excellent memory, Indy. I should. Last time we saw each other, you made me wear the same clothes for three weeks straight. Well, never separate body from clothes, or bad spirits will hide in your pockets. In other words, if people never change clothes, there would be no evil in the world. Exactly. I miss all of your crazy philosophies, Scraggy. Well, they're not so crazy, Indy. These days, there's much evil in the air. I feel it everywhere. Andy Dufresne crawled through 300 miles, miles of, of shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Indian Scraggy continue to walk down the ramp, moving off screen. The camera pans, and we see that there's the a sleeve of a German soldier. Camera stops on the face of Sergeant Helmut Gunterberg. A thin, skeletal Nazi. He resembles the Angel of Death. Gutenberg's face is narrow and sunken. His deep-set eyes are a frightening light blue. His complexion is pale, emotionless. His hair is blonde, stringy. His right arm appears rigid. It rests stiffly at his side. Gutenberg follows Indy and Scraggy through the crowd. The Nazi removes something from his pocket. It is a tiny mechanical item. It resembles a cockroach. We see that it is a, a mini radio transmitter. And Gutenberg whispers into it, who is Brock Powell, who is, let's do Werner, Werner Herstog. Are we making contact? The mechanical roach's eyes blink red. Gutenberg gives a chilling smile. Meanwhile, Indiana and Scraggy arrive at the taxi. Scraggy begins to secure Indy's baggage to the roof. Indy opens the rear door uh, of the cab. He begins to climb into the back seat. He is met with a swift kick to the stomach. He falls to the ground. The wind knocked out of him. Scraggy runs to the open door, uh, scolding the person inside. Scraggy, you're your normal voice. Dr. Clark, why you kick Dr. Jones? Dr. Claire Clark steps out of the shadows of the car. We recognize her from Marcus's film, but she is even more beautiful in person. She is the same age as Indy. Her hair is bright red. She removes her glasses, revealing sparkling green eyes. She is very prim, very proper, but extremely intelligent and quick-witted. She is dressed in khaki slacks and shirt. She uh, speaks in a slight British accent. She hurriedly assists Indiana to his feet, and you are normal voices. Dr. Jones, forgive me. No sweat. Thought I was being attacked by a degenerate sailor. No, just a degenerate archaeologist. Your appearance is deceiving. Likewise. They exchange a handshake and a smile, immediately attracted to each other. Because I wrote it. Sure, why not? Uh, <laughs> I didn't write this. And now we have a porter coming in. And... Uh, <laughs> all right. Isaac... Have you seen Pee-wee's Big Adventure? No, actually, I haven't. I know okay. the character. I know Pee-wee, but... All right. Well, uh, in that case, I'm going to have you be... Do -do 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 -do. Uh, where's your stuff here? Uh, Kermit the Frog. Uh, Indiana Jones. Calling passenger Indiana Jones. Indiana turns as ship porter walks through the crowd, pushing a large barrel on a dolly. Indy waves to the porter. The porter stops in front of him. Uh, you left this aboard ship. You're also Indiana Jones, Ted, if you're even here anymore. Or Kermit the Frog. Ted's gone. I'll be in for this uh, one line. I am here. I am just, <laughs> I was getting a coffee. Uh, a friend of mine owns a cafe. Uh, he'll get us a nice quiet table. No disturbances, just the two of us. What are you? Where are you? I am... What page, page are you 31? on? Page 31. 31. Oh. There must be some the mistake. The lines were not highlighted. There must be some mistake. Sorry I about that. Have my lines highlighted. <laughs> 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 All right. Porter points to a section of the barrel that reads, Deliver to Dr. Jones. That's you, ain't it? Well, uh, yeah, but... Uh, the porter drops the barrel in front of Indiana and hurriedly walks back to the ship. Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Gutenberg continues to spy on Indiana. The Nazi hides a few feet away in a dark alleyway. A puzzled Indiana op begins to open the barrel. Scraggy shouts a warning. And Indy, remember Hultek, god of goodness. Before body make contact with foreign object. Indiana ignores Scraggy and begins to pry open the barrel. You must cast out bad spirits. Uh, Indiana still ignores Scraggy. He struggles with the barrel top, flirting with Claire. May I call you Claire? Please. 
Well, Claire, we've obviously got a lot of notes to compare. Let's get started tonight, over dinner. I'd like that very much. A friend of mine owns a cafe. He'll get us a nice, quiet table. No disturbances, just the two of us. <laughs> Uh, at the moment, the barrel lid flies off, and inside is filled with old brown banana peels. Suddenly, Arnold uh, Betsy's head pokes through the peels. Indiana is shocked. Scraggy sighs. I warn you, Indy, you must always cast out bad spirits. Okay, and a dirty, unkept Betsy leaps out of the barrel. She throws her arms around Indy, and every single one of you are drunk toddlers. For this next scene, you're all drunk toddlers. My precious! Your daughter? My assistant? His girlfriend? Child. It's nothing really. <laughs> what the hell are you even doing here? I was here to prove my love for you. How terribly sordid. You know, that is, that, that's, that, that's puppy love. The schoolgirl cries, she'll get over it. Never. This proves that nothing can come between us. Not an ocean! Not two separate continents either! All right, all right, all right. All right. I think I'm gonna be ill. Yeah. How, oh, how... How is, how are you even still alive? Hey, uh, I'm from Brooklyn. So we've been sailing for three weeks. I threw away in the banana barrel. Ate my way to the bottom. Oh, charming. Uh, hey, Emmy. Who's the baby? Only your intellectual and emotional superior. You're right! You, well, you're you on my nerves a little bit. Miss, um, Miss Dr. Clarity, you. Bessie Tuffet. <laughs> As in curds and whey. <laughs> Listen, sister. You better stay away from Mindy. Oh, my dear. He has no interest in me. I've already celebrated my this many birthday. Yeah, right. Indiana shoots Clara an angry glance. Indy removes a wad of bills from his pocket. He gives them to Betsy. Look, Betsy, <clears throat> why don't you get uh, back on the boat? This time, as a passenger. <laughs> Too late, Indy. Scraggy points towards the ocean liner. The boat is several feet from the shore. It sails back out of the sea. Indy steams. Oh, no. When is the next one, Al? Two weeks. <laughs> Amazing. Indiana grumbles and amused Dr. Clark gets back in the car. Indy shoves Betsy inside. He is furious. But no one in the chat is furious because we have another action gauntlet. And this time, we are going for... Who wants it? Brock or John? Brock or John? Brock pointed. Brock's got it. All right. Brock, action gauntlet for Brock. Give us the first voice. Okay, everyone wants a Fanta and must sing for it. A, f a Fanta? Yes. I don't know what that oh. means. Okay, we're at Indiana Grumbles, right? Right after that, uh, before Indiana gets into the car. Okay. <clears throat> Before Indiana gets in the car, Gutenberg steps out from the alleyway. Fanta, Fanta. He tosses the tiny mechanical cockroach at Indiana. The roach attaches itself to Indiana's trouser leg. Do I have to keep singing? I can do it. It's fine. It's kind of becoming Almost there. Julian. Almost there. The tiny transmitter is very like Indiana. Can feel nothing. He gets into the car, into the car, the car, the car. Scraggy blesses the taxi and gets into the driver's seat. Great. New voice. Cheshire Cat. <laughs> Gutenberg watches as the momras outgrabe and the battered Model T drives off. Oh, did it go that way? 
The Nazi turns, as they often do, walking in opposite directions. The camera follows Gutterberg as he enters a seedy waterfront hotel. Interior hotel. New voice. <laughs> Dr. Evil. Gutterberg walks through the dimly lit lobby, filled with dusty, tacky African furnishings. He turns a corner into a narrow, decrepit <laughs> hallway, and there are lasers on sharks and their freaking heads. He stops <laughs> in the last doorway, room 113. He opens the door with a key and enters. <laughs> You're going to keep going for one more round of that. I like it. Interior room, a small... Musty hotel room, not as small as Mini Me. It is furnished with a single bed, a sofa, two chairs, and a fireplace. Two bizarre African statues adorn the fireplace mantel. Gutenberg carefully locks the room door. He walks to the fireplace. He tilts one of the African statues forward. There's a mechanical creaking sound. And suddenly, Scotty, no. Scotty, no. The suddenly, the sofa begins to move. It slides a few feet, revealing an opening beneath the floor. I like it. A staircase leads into the opening. A gutterbird descends. All right, and Stairs. new voice. I stay with this Mike Myers, Shrek. Shrek, there you go. Interior opening. Ogres are not like parfaits, they're like openings. Gutterberg enters a large, brightly lit room. Stay off my swamp, and we're inside the secret Nazi headquarters. <laughs> Just like Shrek 4. <laughs> the room is filled with various communications equipment and radio transmitters. Several Nazi soldiers are seated before the equipment, and there's absolutely no talking donkeys. Monitoring various radio signals, an enormous glass panel covers one wall. Through the panel, we see two speedboats, long, sleek, high-powered mahogany hull. Sounds like they're compensating for something. Both speedboats are adorned with a swastika, and they float in water in an underground man-made chamber. Directly beside the speedboats, parked on a stone incline, are two automobiles. The cars are enormous, beautiful woodies. And? <laughs> and? Those. and? <laughs> Final voice. Stitch. Stitch. Oh, you're the worst. I don't do Stitch. Okay. Okay. I can give you no, another one. No, no, I'll do Stitch. I, it's really bad, but I will do it. <clears throat> Equipped with a running board and wood panel sides. The cars glisten. Brand new. Gutterberg turns to Klaus, a hulking Nazi who stands at the corner, holding the Klaus's foot. I'd really like to stop, though. <laughs> 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 Can I have another voice, Megan? Oh, sweet Megan, my friend. A vampire who is overly full from drinking too much blood. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> Got to live shouts in order that the clouds. Camera pans the clouds to speed. The Nazi boot is untied. A strong string dangles on the floor. The embarrassed clouds kneels and sloppily reties his shoes. Gutterberg turns to a Nazi who sits at the radio receiver, and the Nazi wears headphones. Same voice. Or keep going. Uh, headphones. I can keep going. I've already forgotten where you are. Uh, I'm just going to jump. I'm going to jump ahead here, uh, Why don't you? and Why? we're just going to introduce that we get to see Lieutenant Werner von Mephisto. He stands before Gutenberg. Mephisto is a Nazi nightmare. His face is thick and bullish. His bulging eyes are reddish brown, giving him the appearance of a demon from hell. He has no facial hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes. He's powder, completely bald. His body is thick, muscular. He's over six feet tall. He glares down at Gutenberg, and Mephisto is voiced by Brock as, uh, well, you just did a vampire, we're doing it anyway, Drac from Hotel Transylvania. So, like, were you successful? <laughs> Gutenberg gives a timid nod. With trembling fingers, he reaches over and turns up the volume on the radio transmission. The voices of Indiana, Betsy Claire, and Scraggy echo through a tinny speaker. Mephisto manages a pleased grunt. 
Keep a record of everything that's said, especially the blah, blah, blah. Gutenberg nudges the officer before him. The officer hurriedly begins to scrawl a manuscript of the radio transmission. Mephisto nods. Uh, ever since our battle for the Lost Ark, the Fuhrer's been very interested in the adventures of Indiana Jones. He's seen all the movies and the, even the TV show where he's a kid for some reason. <laughs> yeah, he's very interested. Oh, you got to be really interested to watch that. All right. Exterior, zoological compound, a miniature zoo. The peaceful compound is surrounded with small man-made lakes and palm trees, countless metal cages filled with various animals. Uh, Indy enters with Claire, Betsy, and Scraggy. The persistent Betsy is annoying Indy. She attempts to snuggle closer to him. Indy pushes her away. Betsy tries to hold his hand. Indy shakes her loose. Scraggy watches all of this, giggling to himself, because someone has to. We hear singing a high-pitched, beautiful voice. Claire walks to the far end of the compound toward the singing. The others follow. Betsy walks by Bonzo, a large chimpanzee. As Betsy passes, the chimp catches a familiar smell. Bonzo begins to follow Betsy. Claire opens the door of the large metal cage. Here, the singing is louder. Claire enters the cage. Indiana follows. Scraggy blesses the cage, then enters. Betsy moves to go inside, but Bonzo's large hairy hand reaches out and grabs Betsy, pulling the girl off screen. Filled with ma uh, interior cage, filled with handmade wooden and bamboo furniture, Tiki, the adorable pygmy from Marcus's film, is inside. He is dressed only in a belted leather loincloth and sandals. He is perched on the floor, working on a large tapestry. The tapestry de depicts a colorful picture of clouds. The buildings of a large city are reflected on the clouds. Tiki pleasantly sings as he goes his way. Upon hearing the cage door open, Tiki looks up. He sees Claire. A joyous smile covers his face. The pygmy runs to Claire, giving her a huge hug and kiss. Claire introduces Tiki to the others. And for this, we've got Claire and Indy. You are now... Uh, Claire, you are Lala Parskian, the fourth cousin of Kim Kardashian. Did I say that right at all? I have no idea. Sure. <laughs> All right, you are that, and Indy, you are. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <clears throat> You're Optimus Prime. Tiki, this is Doctor Jones. <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, Tiki extends his right hand. He shakes Indy's hand. Indiana is charmed by the civilized display of friendship. Indy smiles at Claire. He's a real gentleman. <laughs> Just basic manners, what it takes most men a lifetime to learn. Tiki's accomplished in two weeks. This is our guide, Scraggy Breer and Miss Betts. Claire pauses, noticing that Betsy is missing. Claire suddenly breaks into a laugh. She points off screen, everyone turns. <laughs> Exterior compound, Bonzo is being extremely affectionate towards Betsy. The chimpanzee pulls and grabs at Betsy. It is all very similar to what Betsy was doing to Indiana. Betsy wrestles with Bonzo, calling Indy for help. Everyone chuckles at Betsy's dilemma. It appears that Bonzo is attracted to Miss Tuffet's perfume. Oh, the banana peel. Tiki has gone back to his artwork, ignoring that joke. A fascinated Indiana looks over the pygmy shoulder. Where did you find him? About 10 miles from here, we were on a photographic expedition in the thick of the jungle. I heard sounds, whimpering, moaning. I took a few steps in and found Tiki, and he was lying in a shallow swamp, semi-conscious, a high fever, nearly dead from exhaustion. He had obviously been traveling on foot for many days over countless miles. So I brought him back to the compound, nursed him back to hell. Indiana stares at the pygmy. A skeptical look covers his face. Claire, I hate to quibble with your anthropological abilities. Quibble. <laughs> but if this little fellow is over 200 years old, I mean, what accounts for his youthful appearance? His vitality. 
Claire opens a door at the rear of the cage. It leads to another room directly behind the cage. Claire and Indy enter. Scraggy stays behind. He exchanges a friendly smile with Tiki. Meanwhile, in the background, we see Betsy and the chimpanzee. They roll by on the ground, still wrestling. <laughs> Close up, the Peace Stone. A fruit fly crawls along the peach pit surface. Tiki was wearing this when I found him. Camera pulls back and we're in a small sterile room. The peach stone rests on a table. Indiana and Claire stand over the stone. Indy picks up the stone, examining it. An annoying fruit fly buzzes around Indy's head. Camera pans down to Indy's trouser leg. The radio transmitter is still attached to his pants. The tiny bug's eyes blink red. Cut to Sergeant Gutterberg. He stands inside uh, of Nazi headquarters, huddled over the radio. The voices of Indiana and Claire echo over the speaker. Gutterberg furiously transcribes the conversation. Dr. Jones, you are obviously familiar with the legend of Sun, <clears throat> Sun Wukong's Garden of Immortal Peaches. A bite from the fruit of that peach tree would give a person eternal life, <clears throat> make them forever young. <laughs> the vicious Gutterberg smiles. Uh, camera pans to a notebook. Gutenberg underlines the word forever young as a reminder to rent his favorite Mel Gibson movie. Indiana studying the peach pit. <clears throat> the fruit fly continues to buzz around Indiana's head. Keep going. There's nothing unusual about this. Nothing to indicate that it's from Sun Wukong's garden. Uh, great. Uh, the fruit fly lands on Indiana's neck. He smacks the fly, killing it. A shock, Claire runs to Indiana. She grabs his hand and gently removes the remains of the fruit fly. She glares at Indiana, furious. This fruit fly had a normal lifespan of 24 hours. <laughs> As an experiment, the fly was put in this room alone with only the peach stone to sustain its existence. The fly stayed alive for three weeks until now she flicks the fly across the room indy gives an embarrassed shrug i am sorry <laughs> you never hear optimus say that really he's never apologetic uh indiana and claire are suddenly interrupted by the sound of scraggy and tiki's laughter this is followed by the two of them having a discussion in tiki's foreign tongue claire and indy exchange a shocked glance and dash out of the room all right we are the interior cage scraggy and tiki are having a conversation Claire points to Scraggy, giving a puzzled look to Indy. And so now, Claire, you are a... <laughs> Let's try this one. Dyslexic Debbie doing ASMR. And you know what? Everyone else is doing ASMR as well. So this is the ASMR scene. But I'm dyslexic. Yeah, you're dyslexic. Who understands it? Hundreds of languages. He's the best guy to never come. As to you, where he came from. <laughs> Sc Scraggy nods and asks Tiki. Tiki answers and points to the painting of the clouds. Scraggy translates it. The city. I come from land of city on clouds. What the hell's that supposed to mean? Take us there. Scraggy asks Tiki. Tiki answers. He and Scraggy laugh hysterically. Scraggy looks at Indiana. Say, if he could, he would go back. Tiki offers some information to Scraggy. Scraggy translates. He say, I too may help you. Indiana's eyes widen. Startled, amazed, Claire looks at Indy, puzzled. Hi, Joe! <laughs> the sacred proverbs and writings of Son of Kong. His disciples always carry the black Joe with them. Scraggy asks Tiki, the pygmy nods and removes his belt. He sees the thick belt actually unravels into a cloth scroll. Tiki kisses the scroll and gives it to Scraggy. Scraggy nervously opens the scroll. It is filled with countless ancient Chinese writings and proverbs. Indiana stares over Scraggy's shoulder. <clears throat> Can you translate it? <gasps> Scraggy nods. Suddenly, Betsy and Chimpanzee fall in the frame on top of the scroll. Banzai straddles Betsy. 
trying to open his lips towards her. She is screaming. Bonzo's lips, <laughs> Bonzo moves his lips and Betsy gives her a big kiss. Smack. Betsy grimaces. Finally, Claire begins to make bizarre monkey hand motions and sounds. Bonzo turns. He understands Claire. She continues to communicate with the chimp until Bonzo turns and runs out of the cage. Indiana and Scraggy exchange an impressed glance. Betsy wipes the kiss from her lips. Oh, and that concludes our ASMR section there. Amazing job, everybody, including dyslexic Debbie. The uh, the uh, chat was ready for that to end. I'm yeah. not gonna lie. <laughs> That's fair. Thank you guys Great for job. dealing with that. I I I got it. All right. Uh, interior Dashiell's bar, dimly lit, smoky, filled with cloth, covered tables and ornamental African furnishings. A nine-piece jazz man plays swing tunes. A few couples a few couples sway on the dance floor. The place is swarming with Nazis. Many are seated at the bar. Others are scattered at various tables throughout the restaurant. Some stand in corners lurking in the shadows they are all looking in one direction watching one man indiana jones because that's all nazis care about indy sits with scraggy claire and betsy at a table near the rear of the restaurant they are eating dinner but indy scraggy and claire are more interested in the stone monkey scrolls a very nervous scraggy translates indiana wearing his spectacles takes pages and pages of notes searching for a clue an interested clark an interested claire reads over Indy's shoulder. Betsy tries to become included in the discussion, but everyone ignores her. Scraggy continues to translate. And you know what? For this scene, let's uh, go to the chat, Megan. I need a voice for Scraggy. Pikachu. Pikachu. I need a voice for Betsy. A thick New Zealand accent. Great. And I need one for Indiana Jones. Gangster Merlin Brando. Gangster Marlon Brando, and then, sorry, for Claire as well. A Starbucks customer getting name butchered for the last time. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good work, everybody. I think that is everyone for this next scene. So here we go. Pika, 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 pika. <laughs> Sun Woon Kung, run like fire. He journeyed to make monkey land to build his, rot, his final empire. Who's Sun Wukong? I'm in Monkey Land. That's a definite reference to Africa. Africa? You journeyed to Africa? <laughs> oh, that New Zealand. confirms our suspicions that he may have formed his civilization here. <laughs> <laughs> what civilization? I <laughs> see. Keep it wrapped, son. This doesn't concern you. Fine. Terrific. Who cares about this stuff anyway? We're in a nightclub. We should be having fun. Come on, Indy, let's dance. Later. What a bunch of stiffs. Bet you can't dance. Quite the contrary. I spent several months studying dance. It's a very easy name to spell. Oh yeah? What do you know? The bunny hop? The jitterbug? The bondogia? The kibe kibe? The dungmaro? Huh. African tribal dance? Never heard of them. Of course not. They're beyond the spectrum of your microscopic world. Wow, she is not happy with her coffee. All right, insulted Betty gobbles. Uh, Betsy gobbles down her glass of wine and turns back to Indiana who is still deeply concentrating on the scrolls under the table. Betsy's foot reaches across the floor. It rests on Indy's leg. Betsy begins to rub against Indy's, Indy's trouser leg. The red-eyed mechanical bug is still attached to Indy's trousers. Indy glares at Betsy. Claire reaches for her cup of coffee. Fitting. She notices that the coffee cup trembles slightly. Claire glances beneath the table and sees Betsy rubbing Indy's leg. Claire is disgusted. Above the table, Claire shoots a scowl of disapproval at... Indy, a flustered Indy, tries to explain, but it's suddenly interrupted by a hand on his shoulder. It's Dashiel, or Dashiel, or whatever his name is, the suave, handsome owner of the restaurant. Dashiel gives a charming spy smile to everyone at the table, and so Dashiel is actually a Humphrey Bogart ripoff 
So good luck with Humphrey Bogart. Nice. Yeah. Enjoying your dinners? Nice. <laughs> Everyone nods, expressing their thanks. Dashiell own uh, leans close to Indiana and whispers. Watch yourself, sport. Most of the talk here tonight is about you, and it isn't good. Indiana's eyes dart around the room. He sees the various Nazis watching him. Indy gives a confident smile, a worried Dashiell. Uh, continues whispering to Indiana. I don't know what you've done to the Nazis, but they are certainly no friends of yours. All right. We'll cut to the interior of the zoological compound. It's dark, silent. Many of the animals are asleep in their cages. A security guard keeps watch on the compound. He stands outside of the metal gates. There is a sudden sound. The guard turns. The figure of three men stand before him. In the shadows, the nervous guard places a hand on his holster. And this guard is, I believe... Isaac, and here is your voice, Isaac. You are a man who just survived a horror movie in which his wife, Janet, and two children, Eloise and Jack, were horribly murdered by a malevolent demon. And after years of therapy, has just entered the real world, started dating again, and gotten his first job as a security guard at this zoo. Go. Oh, God! Who's there? We hear a mechanical creak. A man's leather glove hand extends from the shadows. The hand's finger is pointed at the security guard. Close up of various animals. The sound of rapid machine gun fire echoes throughout the camp. Camera records the animal's shocked reactions. The security guard lies on the ground, dead. What a tragic end to his backstory. <laughs> <laughs> that poor guy just got his life back together. Uh, a candle flickers beside what? him. Even even the chat is yelling at you. What? <laughs> you're welcome. We, we love you, Isaac. Isaac, you're doing great. We, oh, we notice the shiny black boots of the three men as they pass the body. Tiki stares into the dark night. Fear covers his face. He is seated inside of the cage. A candle flickers beside him. Uh, Tiki's hands rest on the beautiful tapestry. Tiki listens. He hears footsteps coming towards his cage. Tiki reaches to his side. He grabs a stone dagger. Suddenly, a lewd gunshot. <laughs> Sorry, loud gunshot. <laughs> a uh, splintered lock from Tiki's cage goes spinning around the floor. The cage door creaks open. Gutterberg stands in the doorway. Two Nazi shoulder, shoulders, shoulders, soldiers, helmet and Klaus, who we met earlier, I guess, are beside him. Gutenberg smiles. His stiff right arm extends from his side. His leather gloved index finger is pointing ahead. Tiki growls at the Nazis. He stands, raising the stone dagger over his head. Gutenberg's finger begins to rapidly fire bullets. His mechanical arm is actually a machine gun. The bullets tear through Tiki's tapestry. They make a crooked, tattered line through the beautiful work, destroying it. A terrified Tiki watches. Gutenberg stops shooting. He removes the empty cartridges from a slot in his mechanical arm and replaces it from another. He points the deadly finger at Tiki. A trembling Tiki drops the dagger. The three Nazis walk toward the helpless pygmy. Interior, Dashiell's Bar, Indiana, Scraggy, and Claire continue to excitedly study the map. A neglected Betsy pours herself the last of the wine. She is very drunk, singing along with the band's version of Cole Porter's Night and Day. Shara, can, can we hear a little bit of that, Shara? Let's hear Betsy's singing of Night and Day drunkenly. Night and day, whatever song Brock was singing. Day and night. Day and night. Night and day. Oh, night Megan's happy. Day. Megan's really happy. All right, cool. That was great. Uh, beneath the table, Betsy continues to rub her foot against Indiana's leg. Indiana tries to ignore Betsy's playing. Scraggy continues to translate the scroll. And we've got some more voices. You know what? Chat did us great last time. Let's get the chat again. I need a voice for Scraggy. <sighs> Scraggy is Yoda. Great. I need a voice for Claire. Ooh, how's your Scrooge McDuck? <laughs> Does he have a British accent? He's Scottish. Scottish. Okay, wait, 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 wait. You're new. You have to do over-exaggerated Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Does Claire, and then uh, Indiana? Indiana is Randy Quaid from Christmas Vacation. <laughs> Amazing. 
Uh, and I think that is everyone for the scene. So here we go. With his golden hoop rod and its powerful lightning rays, Sun Wukong built Water Curtain Cave, where 500 days he did live. Ah, uh, the golden... <laughs> the golden hoop rod! Uh, it's probably like a heavenly staff with uh, many different powers, Clark. But no, the ability to transform itself into hundreds of objects. It remains the most priceless treasure of Sun Wukong's empire. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, what is the, the water curtain game? Wow. Sun Wukong's legendary full shitter hideout. Uh, an enormous <laughs> secret cave hidden behind a running waterfall. Uh. <laughs> Claire again reaches for her coffee. The cup and saucer is still trembling. Claire peeks under the table, and again she sees Betsy's foot rubbing Indy's leg. Claire gives a revolted grumble. Indiana wow. excitedly explains Scraggy's <laughs> translation. Ha! This proves that the water curtain cave exists in Africa. Does it mention anything about Sun Wukong's travels? <laughs> mm -hmm. Twisted snake water, only place called. Oh, the Zarn Busy River it has a reputation for its deadly water snakes. <laughs> oh, it would have been Sun Wukong's logical path. Oh, get down, get off, get down. It will also be our logical path, so. Yeah. All right, Claire smiles beneath the table. Betsy's foot? What's it doing, everyone? What's Betsy's foot doing? Continuing to rub Indy's leg. Of course it is. Finally, Indy reaches down, trying to slap Betsy's foot away, but Indy's hand stumbles upon something else. The mechanical bug. Indy tries to remove the bug, but the tiny device won't budge. Uh, above the table, Indy's hand is buried beneath the table, struggling to remove the bug to Claire. It appears as if Indy is playing with Betsy's foot. Claire gives an incredulous look to Indiana, and she's still Arnold. Ah, please try to control that monstrous little of yours. Ah. <laughs> Indiana finally removes the mechanical bug. He lifts it above the table, examining it. Claire is about to ask a question. Indy indicates for her to shh. He covers the bug and whispers to the others. We have to get back to the compound. Tiki may be in danger. Indiana, Claire, and Scraggy hurry for the table. A tipsy Betsy follows... Indiana passes the jazz band. He nonchalantly drops the mechanical bug into the trumpet player's horn. The trumpet player hits a piercing high note. It cut to the Nazi headquarters. The Nazi wearing the headphones emits a loud scream. His eardrums bursting with the trumpet noise. And for that, we enter an action gauntlet. Ah, uh, yeah, we've had some people already safe here. So guess what? John, it is your turn for the Ancient Gauntlet. And yeah. let's hear our first voice. We're going to start with some Darth Vader. All right. You may begin at Interior Compound, page 46. Utaberg, Klaus and Helmet lead the bound and gag Tiki out of the compound. They keep their Lugers at his back. Suddenly, Klaus trips over something. A fawn. Klaus growls. He shouts it. He shouts a German order to Helmut, who grabs a tight hold of the baby deer. Klaus aims his Luger at the fawn's head. Uterberg and Helmut exchange a chilling laugh. Tiki stares in horror. Klaus clicks the Luger, ready to shoot. New voice. Man, Darth Vader looks so sad. He's so sad. <laughs> This is burned some, from head to toe. Someone, someone whose sciatica is acting up. Oh gosh! <laughs> there is an earth-shattering crack. Ugh. A whip shoots in the frame. Mm. The whip wraps itself around the luger, tearing the gun out of Klaus's hand. I yeah. The fawn breaks free and runs off. The Nazis exchange a shocked glance, and they. Ah, they turn and see Indiana Jones. He, he, he stands a few feet away, you know, holding up the whip. This is so painful. Indiana points to Tiki, <laughs> angrily shouting to the Nazis. And for this, uh, Ted, for this one line, you're Crispin Glover. Yeah. From Back to the Future. 
Get your hands off him. There you go. All right. And new voice for John. How's your Scrooge McDuck? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, God. Bless me, bagpipes. Oh, look at that cat. Gutenberg lost. He put ha, ha, ha. finger in Indiana. At Indiana. Indy is puzzled. The finger begins to shoot rapid machine gunfire. Indy dives for cover. Holding Tiki captive, the Nazis turn and begin to run out of the compound. Indy gets to his feet. He lifts his gun, ready to shoot. But the Nazis are running behind several rows of cages filled with animals. Indy can't shoot. He dashes back outside. All right, new voice? On oh, James Bond. Another James Bond. He already did James Bond. Figure, I've done uh, like a different one. I was gonna say, I was gonna give you a different one. Uh, Scooby-Doo! Great. <laughs> Located on the waterfront, roundless rows of wrong wooden racks line a arena. Rarazzi's run below a rotted ancient rock. Here, one of their speed roads breaks. Road are running. Rudolph, a ready Razzi, is at a wheel. They're not here already crying to the same road. But they're not giving it any of them. All right, new voice. <laughs> okay, Andy Circus having to do all of his biggest roles at the same time, or just Gollum if you must. <laughs> the breath. Indy runs to the Scraggy Model T. Scraggy, um, Scraggy sits in the driver's seat. Betsy and Claire sit in the rear. A drunk Betsy still sings night and day. Indy leaps into the sideboard. He sees the Nazis ahead. Climb um, into the speedboat. Indy motions for Scraggy to drive fast into the dock. The Nazi speedboat shoots forward beneath the dock. Craggy model, there's no cap on me all over my face. Follows above along the shaggy dock. Indiana rides the car's rusted sideboard. He sees the speedboat follow through the wide open in the dock slated boards. Indy begins to shoot at the Nazis. Guterberg raises his mechanical arm, firing shots back to Indiana. All right, new voice. Lumiere or someone overly French. Uh, Machine gun fires, splinters the dark boards, slashing through the metal tea. The side mirror is blasted to pieces. The floor beneath the sea, eh? and Claire it erupts with flying bullets. Just missing the girls. Claire is horrified. Betsy laughs hysterically. The Model T is less than 20 feet from the end of the dock. If they continue ahead, the car will plunge several feet into the water. <laughs> but Scraggy doesn't take his foot from the gas. <laughs> Gutenberg smiles, seeing the vast ocean ahead, knowing he's almost free as he dodges bullets. Indiana sees the end of the dock ahead. He shouts to Scraggy. Uh, normal voice, Indiana. When I tell you, hit the brakes. And new voice? Molly Shannon, superstar. <laughs> Scraggy nods. The end of the dock is only a few feet ahead. Getting closer and closer. Claire covers her eyes. Puts her fingers between her armpits. And smells them like this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Between hiccups, Betsy approaches. Betsy laughingly sings. Indy looks to the speedboat. And now I'm going to do a monologue from this very movie we're reading right now. Back to the approaching dock edge, he pauses, waiting for the right moment. He screams, now, Scraggy. A new voice for the finishes up. Someone who's, someone who's yelling at their dog for being bad. Scraggy. Scraggy's foot slams on the brakes, huh? 
A sudden jolt sends Indy flying into the air. No, no, no. The speedboat shoots out from beneath the dock. Ah. Indiana lands directly on top of the speedboat. Ah. A spectacular stunt. No. Helmet points his gun at Indy. Indy reacts with a swift kick to Helmet's jaw. Come here. The Nazis hit the deck. Out cold. Aw. Klaus comes for Indy. Boom. They begin to fight. An angry Guterberg shoots, tries to shoot, but Indy and Klaus move too quick. Ah! Too quickly. <laughs> Guterberg can't get a clear shot. The Model T has come to a stop. Stop. Safe. <laughs> ah. Its front wheels teeter over the dock's edge. Scraggy, Betsy, and Claire get out. Ah! Get out. Come on. Claire catches her breath, knees shaking. Ah. Betsy is still laughing. And for this line, <laughs> Betsy, this line, Betsy, you're Cindy Lauper for this one line. Read the line About and sing. Last time we had some fun. Love it. Uh, and now that's the end of your action. Good work. Congratulations yeah. for another action gauntlet completed. Uh, don't rest too easy. Uh, everyone else, a worried Scraggy sees Indiana fighting with the Nazis. And for this, if you can, t I don't know. Let's uh, let's do uh, for this one line. Uh, oh, that's the wrong person I'm looking at. I don't know. Just be scraggy. <laughs> it's one line. <laughs> Bad spirits have Indy. He is in trouble. Be trouble. Scraggy runs off of the screen, and we have another action gauntlet. Oh, oh this is all action here, people. Uh, someone seems to be ducking out of the way. <laughs> Guys, there's so much fun. Yep. There's well, so much fun. <laughs> guess so what? Much fun. It is Shara's turn for an action gauntlet. <laughs> We believe in her. We believe in Shara. <laughs> there you go. Give her a voice to start with. <laughs> How do you feel about the dude? Um, Big Lebowski. Big Lebowski. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Okay. Scraggy runs off screen. The Nazi speedboat is headed towards the side of the enormous ocean liner. Gutenberg radios for help. Indiana and Klaus continue to fight. Rolling along the deck, exchanging punches. A bound tiki watches with wide eyes, man, helpless. Speedboat makes a sudden sharp turn, avoiding a collision with the ocean liner. Indiana and Klaus tumble off the boat into the water. All right, Underwater. New, new voice. Bill or Ted. Yeah. Uh, underwater, Indiana and Klaus continue their battle. They Vessel only a few feet from the ship's large spinning steel propellers. The propellers create a suction force, drawing Indy and Klaus closer, closer toward a spinning deck. Indy and Klaus grab hold of dangling steel anchor, preventing their bodies from being sucked into the propellers. Klaus pulls a switchblade from his pocket. He attacks Indy clenched fingers with the knife. Indy begins to lose his grip, man, and it's crazy. His body's inches from the propellers. Klaus raises the knife to finish off Indiana, but Klaus's untied shoelace dangles beside the propellers. The shoelaces catches the spinning blade. The shock Nazi is pulled into the propellers. Indiana turns away, man, only dialing into the anchor. A blood red cloud surges through the surrounding water. Indiana climbs the anchor to safety. All right, man. new voice. Creepy haunted kid with creepy giggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <The> water. <laughs> Indiana surfaces. <laughs> Taking a gulp of air, suddenly the water in front of him erupts. <laughs> With machine gun fire, Indiana sees Gutenberg. He's parked the Nazi speedboat only a few feet away. Gutenberg smiles. And Gutenberg is uh, Snagglepuss. Hey! Good night, Dr. Jones! 
haven't seen my guitar even. Love you, Brock. <laughs> All right, uh, new voice. Um, Rory or Lorelai, or I'm gonna throw this any West Wing character. <laughs> never, I've never watched an episode. Of so Basically, explain. talk really, really Eat fast. Me a lot. Okay. Just like really, really fast. Just like okay. as fast as you can. Go. Okay. There is a loud gunshot. Gutenberg's mechanical arm is hit by a bullet. Pieces of spring metal and sprockets fly from the wound. Gutenberg turns furious. Dashiell, the night club owner, is a few feet away. He's driving a speedboat sleek. It is it, side adorned with an American flag. Dashiell points a pistol at Gutenberg, ready to take another shot. With a roar, the Nazi speedboat dives away towards the cluster of docks. Indiana climbs into Dashiell's speedboat. Stay Humphrey Bogart, man. Craggy said you might be needing some help, sport. Keep Dash going. Hits the gas. Dashiell hits the gas, tearing through, tearing after the Nazis. A frenzied high-speed chase begins through the darkness beneath the row of docks. The speedboat, speedboats face countless obstacles. They swerve around a virtual forest of wooden poles, which fly by at breakneck speed. The men duck and dodge, dangling fish books and nets. Many paths are blocked by the wooden rafts and rowboats. Note, because of the darkness, the obstacles appear only when they are <laughs> three feet ahead of the speed speedboats, and this makes the chase completely surprising and scary, okay? Causing a funhouse effect. All right, Throughout new voice. Chase, indeed, Amazing. Okay. Constipated Nick Cage afraid of bees. <laughs> <laughs> mm, throughout the chase, Indiana and the Nazi continue to exchange gunfire. Frustrated Gutenberg can't shoot the mechanical uh, machine gun that is rendered useless by Dashiell's bullet. Mm, he continues to radio Nazi headquarters oh, for help. Dashiell catches up with the Nazi. We will just travel side by side. The recorded helmet. <laughs> Look at right, Indiana, but Indiana leaves through the Nazis, the troop falling, rolling, tumbling, traveling for gas. They fight between the two speed boom, crack below them slightly, opening and closing. Up ahead, an enormous stone pole appears to avoid collision. The speedboats must separate. Dashiell screams. Indy, roll out. All right, last voice. Hopeful college auditionee wanting to get a role in cats. <laughs> Indy frees himself from helmet and rolls back onto Dashiell's boat. Helmet looks up. He sees the stone pole ahead of the net. Helmet tries to move too late. The two boats separate. Helmet smacks into the pole. Dashiell turns away from the wheel. You okay, sport? Indiana peeks to answer and sees something ahead. All right, and with that, that ends Shara's action Woo! gauntlet. Uh, amazing work. <laughs> and uh, guess what? Uh, Indiana, you got a line. Say your line. Dash. Great. Now it's your turn for an action gauntlet, because this scene keeps going. And it oh, is, man. as you thought, just the scene from Last Crusade, where the boats, the speed boats chase from Last Crusade. Even if, even if we couldn't understand what was going on. Oh, oh. All right, oh, so Ted, it is your turn for an action gauntlet here, starting with that line right after your, uh, right after your dash. So Megan, make Ted work for it. Dark Crystal, go. Ooh, you turns back. The speedboat is headed straight for a solid wooden wall. A sign on the wall reads, for the men's fishing warehouse. The Nazi speedboat has already made a sharp turn. Avoiding the warehouse. There's no time for Dashiell to turn. If he hits the deck, the speedboat arches upward at an angle. Crash. The speedboat blasts into the warehouse. Splintered wood splatters through the air. Interior warehouse. Dashiell speedboat bursts through another wall. The boat skids across the warehouse floor, screeching to a stop. A second Dashiell gets out. Indy runs to the window. There it is. All right, new voice. Johnny Carson. Uh, Indiana's POV, the Nazi speedboat shoots out of the docks, escaping across the water. Indiana grabs his whip. He kicks open the warehouse window. He snaps his wrist, cracked. The whip shoots forward, attaching itself to the rear of the Nazi speedboat. Indy firmly grips the, his end of the whip. The whip tightens. Whoosh! Indiana's pulled out of the window. 
Gutenberg exchanges a victorious laugh with Rudolph, the speedboat driver. Thinking they have lost Indiana, a frightened Tiki looks back, his eyes suddenly fill with hope. Gutterberg turns, his mouth drops open. And new in voice. C-3PO. Indiana uses his whip to water ski behind the Nazi speedboat. A red-faced Gutenberg slams his fist on the dashboard. He removes a sharp knife. He hurriedly begins to slice through Indy's whip, trying to break the connection. Indiana aims his pistol at Gutenberg, but suddenly a shot whizzes by Andy's head. Indy's head, followed by another, and another. Coming from behind, Indy turns. A second Nazi speedboat is in hot pursuit. There are five Nazis inside, armed with pistols and rifles, all firing shots at Indiana. Meanwhile, Gutenberg's knife continues to slice through Andy's whip. Only a few threads remain. Very nice. Indy and next. Miss Piggy. Meanwhile, Gutenberg's knife continues to slice through Andy's whip. Only a few threads remain, and they're on a boat learn some expert water skiing, flirting, running, jumping, all in an attempt to avoid the flying bullets from behind. Suddenly, Andy's whip snaps, and the Anna swirls in the water, directly in the path of the second Nazi speedboat. Jackie hides his eyes, got a pair of laughs. All right, new voice. That was great. <laughs> Andre the Giant. The Nazis in the second speedboat are delighted, shaking each other's hands. Camera pans to below the speedboat. We move underwater. Sound traffic music soars. We see Indiana very much alive. He straddles the bottom of the speeding boat, holding on with all his strength. Indiana climbs toward the side of the speedboat, battling the pressure of the rushing water. New voice. Camera follows Indiana out of the water. New voice. As he climbs aboard the second Carrie, speedboat. Carrie Eloise has a tuxedo wearing cat statue that comes to life. Wait, say that again. Carrie Eloise has a tuxedo wearing cat statue that comes to life. Is that just what Lee does? No, that's what the movie you just watched, the cat movie. Carrie always was the oh, cat shit. in the top hat. The or Nazis whatever. in the second speedboat are delighted, shaking each other's hands. Camera pans to below the speedboat. We move underwater. Soundtrack music soars. We see Indiana very much alive. He straddles the bottom of the speeding boat, holding on with all his strength. Indiana climbs toward the side of the speedboat, battling the pressure of the rushing water. Camera follows Indiana out of the water as he climbs aboard the second speedboat. The four Nazis are laughing, talking. Their backs turn to the approaching Indiana. Moving like lightning, Indy grabs one of the Nazis and tosses him overboard. With a swift punch to the stomach and jaw, Indy sends another Nazi into the water. The other two Nazis tackle Indy. They fall to the deck, fighting. Gutterberg looks back, shocked that Andy is still alive. Gutterberg growls, frustrated. His eyes suddenly light. He spots something ahead. Two gargantuan ocean liners are moving towards each other, coming together. There is an opening between the two ships that continues to get smaller as the ships move closer. Kutabuk smiles. An idea! He orders Rudolph to drive through the opening in the second speedboat. The Nazis have overcome Indiana. All right, One stop, 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 stop. That was the end. That was the end of your, your, your action gauntlet. You oh, amazing man. Uh, good work, Ted. <laughs> good God. Uh, and because this is finishing up this scene here, we have our final action gauntlet. Who's left? <laughs> All right, are you ready for this, Dee Dee? No. Action no. gauntlet, starting with in the second speedboat. Give her a voice. All right. Cam or Mitchell from Modern Family? <laughs> <clears throat> In the second speedboat, the Nazis have overcome Indiana. One Nazi pins Indy down. The other removes a thick metal chain from his neck. A red swastika dangles from the chain. The Nazi wraps the chain around Indy's neck. He begins to strangle Indiana. Gutterberg's speedboat moves towards the ocean liners. The opening between the two ships continues to shrink, getting smaller and smaller. New voice. Human taco. <laughs> The second speedboat is directly behind Gutenberg. The Nazis are strangling Indiana. 
color begins to leave in his face. He gasps for air. That's a tall taco. All right, new voice. Ray Romano. Oh, 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 oh. oh. The op oh yeah. <laughs> the opening between the two ocean liners continues to get smaller, less than ten feet wide. Got a boat. Got a bird. Speedboat is only oh. few few feet away. I can't get that register. Ah. <laughs> uh. You got this. Uh, new voice. Cardi B. Through his fluttering eyes, it, Indiana sees Gutterberg's speedboat headed for the ocean liners. Indiana is nearly unconscious. The giggling Nazis tighten the chain around his neck, around his neck. With less than an inch to spare, Gutterberg's speedboat squeezes between the two ocean liners. That's right, squeezing like a thong. The second speedboat is only a few feet from the ocean liners, but as the ship moves closer, the opening is nearly closed. The driver can't turn away. He's too close. He emits a scream. The Nazis pause from strangling Indiana. They turn, and then they twerk. <laughs> New voice. Amazing. Anthony Hopkins making dinner. <clears throat> Indy moves fast. He dives overboard into the water. With father beans and a nice Chianti. The speedboat hits the opening too small. The speedboat is crushed between the two ocean liners. The Nazis let out their final screams, followed by a fiery explosion. Flaming pieces of the wreckage are splattered through the night sky. There is. Are you listening? Goldberg turns, his grinning, sadistic face lit by the explosion. Tiki's eyes are filled with fear. <laughs> Ah, uh, beautiful. To fill it, take us with another one. Take us home. Thor's Asgardian accent. <laughs> Thor's Asgardian accent. As Thor. Thor Asgardian accent. Thor's accent. Thor's, Thor's accent. accent. Just be Thor. Just say Thor. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> I'm saying what the chat said. Sorry. Go. Chat's gonna hate me because I don't watch superhero movies. <clears throat> Several feet away, Indiana jumps <laughs> alive. He swims to the nearby shore and climbs out of the water with a hammer. He rubs his reddened neck, catches his breath, and looks into the distance. Indy sees Gutenberg's speedboat too far to catch. Gutenberg sees the silhouette of Indy standing on the distant shore. Gutenberg orders the driver to move faster. The engine roars. Gutenberg looks at Indy. The Nazi emits a maniacal laugh that pierces the air. You want me to finish it out with this one? Uh, one last voice, Megan. Um, um, Beetlejuice. <laughs> Indiana watches a speedboat escape into the night. His eyes fill with rage, vengeance. Claire, Scraggy, and a very drunk Betsy join Indy on the shore. Betsy puts her arms around Indiana. She rests his, rests his head on his shoulder. She closes his eyes and emits a drunken sigh. And there you go. That is the end of your action gauntlet. Thank you, Dee Dee, for going through what? that. Well done. Uh, amazing, everyone. Good work. Uh, so now, Betsy, you're drunk. You're just yeah. drunk. What an amazing night. An annoyed Indy pushes Betsy away in a drunken stupor. Betsy moves to the next person, Claire, thinking she uh, she's still with Indiana. Betsy puts her arms around Claire. A worried Claire is too concerned with the departing Nazi speedboat. Claire turns to Inky, and, uh, you know what? Yeah, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do this thing here, people. Uh, you are, what haven't I done yet with you? Uh, you're a Southern matron, Claire, and Indiana, you are, <laughs> uh, you're Yondu. And Betsy, you are drunk, but you are a drunk. Uh, you're just a drunk. I just like drunk, Shara. You're just drunk. Be drunk. Great. And Scraggy, yeah. you are uh, Professor Snape. No. Yeah, why the hell not? I read the wrong one, but I'm going to have you be Professor Snape. Will they hurt Tiki? 
They know he's important to us. They'll use him to bargain for this. <laughs> Eyes closed, resting his head, resting her head on Claire's shoulder, Betsy sighs. And he smells so good. So masculine. Claire pushes Betsy away. Betsy spins and wraps her arms around Scraggy. Claire watches this Nazi speedboat disappear into the night. Will they be following us? Every step of the way! Betsy's still thinking she's, uh, she's uh, snuggling with Indy. Anna rubs her face against Scraggy's bristly beard. Mmm, Indy, I love her when you don't shave. It was so sexy. Scraggy pushes uh, Betsy away. She spins, this time putting her arms around a hanging fisherman's net filled with fish. Meanwhile, Scraggy looks at Indiana and Claire. Pandura, god of purity, say, always stay ten paces ahead of bad spirit. Exactly! We can't let the Nazis get to the city first! If they do, they'll wipe out one of the greatest archaeological finds in history, baby! Indiana turns and walks away. Claire and Scraggy hurriedly follow. There is no time to lose. The drunken Betsy continues to embrace the net of dead fish. Betsy turns, eyes closed. She smiles. Oh, what a little good my kiss. Betsy kisses the lips of a dead fish. She smiles, impressed. Mmm, <laughs> Indy. You really know the way to a girl's heart. Oh, yeah. All right. Let me check one thing here, people, folks. Do, 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 do. All right. We got it. We are at 8.30. How's everybody feeling? Everyone still good? Hot. All right. We're close. We're very close here. Uh, here we go. And let's get through this wording. Uh, Betsy opens her eyes face to face with the dead fish. Betsy screams and runs toward the departing Indiana, Claire and Scraggy. Exterior, Zambezi River the following day. Early morning, the sparkling waters of the Zambezi are lined with thick jungle. Sounds of screeching gibbons, exotic birds, chattering insects. It's a jungle. We get it. A uh, 55-foot tattered wooden river boat, the Adobo, travels along the Zambezi. The boat is filled with various crates and barrels and supplies, and there are several men, crew members, all natives of Mozambique. They are a motley crew, all armed with swords and daggers. They're dirty, tattered, unkempt. The boat pulls a long wooden raft behind it. Scraggy's Model T attached to the raft. Uh, one of the crew members, a young man, sits on the raft. He strums a beaten guitar, singing a folk song. Indiana stands at the ship's steering wheel, forehead covered with sweat. He guides the ship along the twisted waters. Claire exits from a cabin, clearing, uh, carrying a stenographer's notebook. She looks radiant. Her red hair shimmers in the morning sun. Uh, Claire walks up beside Indy. She crinkles her nose, and we get Claire and Indy, Claire and Indy, and a Betsy in there. And you know what? We like the chat. They've been good to us. Let's get a chat for, I need one for Indiana. Sid Sloth from Ice Age. Sid the Sloth from Ice Age, John Luizamo. Or SpongeBob. Oh. Okay, uh, and then uh, Claire. Uh, Larry King. <laughs> All right, she's laughing. That's fine. Uh, and Betsy. <clears throat> General Grievous. I don't think she knows who General Grievous is. Um, Jesus. Jesus, you're just you're Jesus. <clears throat> awesome. All right, here we go. Initiate scene. What is that awful aroma? Scraggy's taking a shower. Ah! Indy points off screen. Scraggy, fully clothed, stands here. He rubs a large, fresh onion over his face. Arms and legs, squeezing the onion juice over his body. Indy explains to a befuddled Claire. He believes that onions keep bad spirits from entering his body. Claire? Oh. Sorry. Sorry if I didn't highlight it. In all my years of anthropology... I've never run across anyone or anything quite like Scraggy. He's a rare breed. About Scraggy. <laughs> He's a rare breed. You're looking very lovely. You're looking very lecherous. Just trying to be friendly. Ma. Save it for the schoolgirls. Look, Claire. Betsy's just an anxious archaeology student. She admires my work. Who can blame her? But it's just some kind of hero worship thing. There was never any romance. That's your line, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> oh. Sorry. No, it got a formatting error. Continue, Betsy. I dreamed about our first night together. 
Indy sighs. Claire disgustingly shakes her head. She continues to scrawl more into her notebook. Indy, Anna, gives her a startled look. You're writing this down? I'm keeping an accurate record of our journey. What's that got to do with my personal life? Evidence. <laughs> I plan on testifying at your child molestation trial. Indiana shakes his head, staring into the distance, he sighs. <sighs> Why do I do this to myself? <laughs> Holding her head in pain, Betsy turns to Claire. Hey, lady. You're supposed to be a doctor. Got any cures for a hangover? The best I've heard was used by a New Zealand tribe. I interviewed them in 1989. One part crushed owl skull, two parts rhino saliva, one part zebra dandruff. Betsy's face becomes pale. Indy interrupts. No, no, get a cup of donkey sweat, two spoons of skunk hair, and one pint of shredded lizard tongue. Betsy turns a light shade of green. Scraggy argues, and Scraggy is... Where did you go on the sheet? There you are. Uh, Oogie Boogie from A Nightmare Before Christmas. Ooh, I always use family cure. Two spoons chopped leeches, half cup horse mucus, and two quarts crocodile urine. Isaac, you make me so happy. All right. <laughs> Good work. Excuse me. <laughs> Betsy runs off screen. The others exchange a shrug. Scraggy looks at the river ahead. So, how far we travel, Indy? Almost 20 miles. Any sign of the Nazis? As long as we keep up this pace, they'll have trouble tracking us. Camera pans from the hopeful faces of Indiana, Scraggy and Claire, to the cabin behind him. There, a crew member hides in the shadows. His face hidden, he holds a small radio receiver. He whispers into the receiver, speaking in perfect German. Cut to Gutenberg. He is seated in Nazi headquarters. He repairs his detached machine gun arm, which sits on a table be before him. Behind Gutenberg, a group of Nazis listen to the radio transmission of Scraggy's treacherous crew member who discloses the location of the riverboat. The Nazi chart out of the boat exact, uh, the Nazi charts out the boat's exact location on a large wall map. Lu Luit, uh, Mephisto supervised the project. Tiki, bound, gagged, and bruised, watches from a corner. Mephisto looks at all the Nazis. Unfortunately, Brock had to head out early, so I will take over. And so uh, give me a voice for Mephisto for this one line. Spider-Man. What is it? Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, my Spider-Man's just a little boy's voice, but here you go. <laughs> we must leave immediately! I'm Spider-Man! <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, night it Dissolved to Night in the Jungle, various shots of exotic animals, a creeping panther, a sleeping white bat, a tense scorpion, a family of crocodiles, a bored ship. Indiana, Scraggy, Claire, and Betsy are gathered on the deck. Seated in a circle, they are surrounded by the crew members. Everyone eats their dinner from tin cans. The surrounded lanterns cast an eerie light over the area. The young crew members play a soft, spooky tune on the guitar. Betsy is restless. She glares a guitar player. So we've got Betsy, Indiana, and Claire. Awesome. And Scraggy. So uh, new voices from the chat for all of them. We're in the home stretch here, people. All right, I need a person on Hollywood Boulevard trying to peddle their new CD. Okay, that's that's Betsy. I need Adam Driver. And that is, uh, that's uh, Indiana, uh, Dee Dee, Dee Dee, you're Adam Driver. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nick Nolte with a toothache. That's Indiana Jones. <laughs> and more? one more for Scraggy. <laughs> Mortal Kombat, any voice. Any voice in Mortal Kombat. All right, here we go. And begin. Hey, hey, don't you know something else? Something on beat? The guitar player ignores Betsy, continuing to play. Betsy sighs, upset and bored. It's so hot, stuffy. Do we have to stay on this stupid boat all night? Because I got something else for you if you just want to come. Oh, we have to keep moving. <laughs> Can we at least jump in the water and go for a swim? There, the, 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 there's an old legend about the Zambezi. In, in ancient times, criminals were given their choice of execution or swimming across the Zambezi. Most chose execution. Players right. Oh, obviously we're on the boat. No. Mm, now quit your moaning and eat your food. An angry Betsy tosses her tin can overboard. She stands furious with Indiana. 
Listen, you are so rude, okay? I travel thousands of miles just to come be here with you, and everybody treats me like dirt, you know what I mean? And it's like, if you want to get something for me, I want to give you something, but you got to give something back to me. Nobody even talks to me without making some condescending remark. They think I'm too stupid to understand. I'm not stupid, okay? I'm not stupid. I'm just not that smart. So maybe, I don't know a lot of weird things about tribal dances. I'm still pretty good with anthropology and archaeology. Maybe I could even help out if somebody gave me a chance, you know, just like one little chance. If you just like give me something, okay? Clued me in to what we're doing here you know because whether you like it or not indiana jones i'm part of this expedition too claire raises an eyebrow impressed indiana says nothing he can't argue scraggy interjects my friend's also curious about where we journey to wendy all right the crew members nod staring at indiana indiana turns to claire she smiles tell us all a bedtime story dr jones uh, amazing. All right, cool. And so we've got the bedtime story here for Indiana and Scraggy and uh, Betsy and Claire. All right, here we go. Let's hear this bedtime story. And Indiana, you are Adam West. And Scraggy, you are uh, Barack Obama. And you know what? Uh, everyone else is Barack Obama with Adam West. Let's do that. <laughs> Three Barack Obamas and an Adam West. Let's see how that goes. Long ago, a place known as the Flower Fruit Mountain in the Chinese province of ALA was struck by lightning. Oh, a stone monkey, Sun Wukong, was born. Now, uh, this, this monkey, he could uh, walk like a, a human. More than human, he was blessed with countless heavenly powers, but it wasn't enough. Sun Wukong wanted to learn the secret of eternal life, of immortality. Equipped with his golden hooped rod to protect him, Sun Wukong traveled the world for many years, learning the secret philosophies and teachings of eternal youth. Eventually, he was granted entrance to heaven, where the Jade Emperor gave Sun Wukong the title of Great Sage of the Heavens and permitted him to oversee the Garden of Immortal Peaches. All right, Ted, switch to Jeff Goldblum. Okay. Um, Jeff Goldblum. Uh, he... Uh, 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 <laughs> after se several years, the, uh, the stone monkey uh, uh, <laughs> returns to somewhere on Earth... Uh, here he, he ruled an empire, a civilization of, of monkeys and, and humans who uh, had uh, uh, lifespans of many hundred years. Uh, the, the exact whereabouts of that lost city has been a, a, a mystery for, for a hundred of years until Dr. Ooh, Dr. Clark discovered the pygmy. <laughs> nice. The crew members, Scraggy, Betsy, and Claire, listen with fascination as his voice has now changed again because we're at the end. Uh, let's do... Oh, Dr. Claw always makes me happy. It's uncertain just how much of this legend is based in reality. Nevertheless, we're hoping to find some sign of lost civilization. Uh, what about, uh, Sun Wukong? What if he was a stone idol, an actual monkey, or human being is unknown? But he is one of the most influential religious figures in history, and his remains are most likely somewhere in the lost city. Suddenly, they are interrupted by a distant sound, a low rumbling sound, bizarre, unearthly, unlike anything we've heard before. Indiana turns to Scraggy. Sound familiar. It is far, far away, many miles. Betsy? What is it? Some kind of weird animal? Uh, uh, listen. No animal sounds like that. Now, it's my opinion. It could be, uh, Bansy Bop. <laughs> now, now, Bansy Bop? Bop, Bop, Bop? Just hear me, hear me out for a minute. Bansy Bob is a giant demon from hell. He's, uh, 50 feet tall, breathes fire, makes sound like human never hear before. Now, uh, Malia says he's made up of all evil in the world. Now, uh, I consulted with my two daughters and my wife, 
And they both said, cheery thought. The sound suddenly stops. Everyone exchanges a frightened, terrified glance. Indiana stands. Uh, whatever the hell it is, it went to sleep for the night, which is what we should do. All right, cut to later that night, long shot the boat. The boat sails along the river. Beneath the moonlight, a lone crew member stays awake at the sterling wheel. Other crew members sleep along the deck. Scraggy sleeps in a hanging cot. Indiana is asleep in the cabin. Suddenly, the door slowly creaks open. A shadow appears on the cabin wall, coming toward Indiana. The shadow extends a hand. The hand grabs Indy's blanket. Indy wakes. He leaps out of bed and tackles the mysterious person. Indy flips on the cabin lamp. The intruder is none other than Betsy. Indiana pulls Betsy to her feet. She gives a flirtatious smile. And yeah. Betsy, let's just be, you're just as Brooklyn a girl as you can be. And from Brooklyn. Indiana, you're also from Brooklyn. All right. Couldn't sleep. The heat. I'm in the mood for passion. Yeah, I'm in the mood for isolation, so whatever. <laughs> Indiana leads Betsy to the open door, begins to push her back outside. Betsy stops. I'm not leaving till I get a kiss. Betsy, Betsy, Betsy. One kiss, or I'll scream so loud. I swear to God, I'll take up the, I'll wake up the whole boat and I'll take it. Indiana has no choice. He sighs. All right, already. Just one. Yeah. Keep your mouth closed, though. No. Right. They kiss. <laughs> Betsy wraps her arms around Indiana, turning it into a passionate kiss. At that moment, across the hall, Claire exits the bathroom, toothbrush in hand. She sees the kissing Indiana and Betsy. Oh, man, Claire stares, open mouth shocked. Indiana opens his eyes. He sees Claire watching him, and angry Claire marches into her room. She slams the door. We hear Claire locking the door behind her and moving a piece of furniture in front of the door. Indiana pushes Betsy away, angry. He quickly closes the door. Betsy walks back to her room. A huge, satisfied smile covers her face. The following morning, sunrise, peaceful, calms, birds sing, all that crap. Oh, man, a hand suddenly shoots out of the water, gripping a rusted, sharp knife, followed by another hand, and another, and another, until there are countless hands reaching for the side of the riverboat. The hands grab hold of the boat. Several dark figures slowly rise out of the water. Only the outlines of the bodies are visible, backlit by the rising sun. The figures climb up the side of the boat, carefully creeping, moving silently. Indiana stands at the rear deck, shirt wrapped around his waist. He is shaving. Claire sits a few feet away, writing in her journal. Indy glances to her, curious. And uh, you are uh, Lucy and Ricky. From I Love Lucy. In case that's too old a reference. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, Lucy. Uh, what's up with your writing? <laughs> oh, Ricky, the erotic adventures of Indiana Jones, professor of perversity. Very funny. <laughs> Camera pants to the front deck, stopping on the driver. He stares ahead, steering the ship. Suddenly, a figure appears behind the driver. The figure grabs the driver around the neck. Before the driver can scream, the figure slices his throat. Scraggy witnesses this, though, through an open portal. His face covered with shock. Interior, lower cabin, Betsy stands over a large skillet. She fries pancakes. Lifting the first pancake, Betsy places on a plate and rests aside. She was making fucking pancakes. All right, don't write about this for half a page. Uh, she hears giggling behind her. She turns and sees an oriental pirate. That's the term they used in the 80s. I'm just reading it. I'm just reading it. <laughs> All right, tall, muscular. The pirate towers over Betsy. He is dressed in colorful, tattered clothes. The pirate laughs. His bloated mouth dribbles with pancake crumbs because he ate one of the pancakes. I skipped over that. Betsy steps back, frightened. The pirate removes a dagger from his belt, eyes filled with lechery. The pirate moves towards Betsy. She grabs the skillet, throwing hot oil in the pirate's face. He screams. Betsy dashes out of the kitchen. Indiana, his nearly finished shaving. He's trying to convince Claire of his innocence. She continues to write, ignoring him. Ah, uh, Betsy, you're blowing this Betsy thing all out of proportion. <laughs> oh, Ricky Ricardo rolls over at his grave. And he's a fictional character, so it's really interesting that he does that. Indiana leans down. He rinses his face on a large bucket of water. A dagger flies into frame, just missing Indiana. It sticks into the wall a few feet above Indy's head. Claire witnesses this, shocked, aware, unaware of the danger. Indiana raises his head out of the bucket. He still tries to reason with Claire. It's not as if I have this sleazy reputation. 
Claire is trying to interrupt Indy, trying to point out the dagger, but before she can say a word, Indy again leans into the water bucket. Another dagger shoots in the frame, into the wall, this time only inches above Indy's head. Indiana again raises his head. I am a respected, honored, admired... Claire leaps forward. She pushes Indy out of the way. Moments before, another dagger flies into frame, sticking into the wall. Indy and Claire turn. Three pirates stand here, dirty, toothless, ugly, swords extended. They move towards Indiana and Claire. Indiana's eyes dart to the water bucket, uh, to the water bucket table. His whip and pistol rest here, out of reach. Indiana and Claire are trapped. The pirates move closer. And that's where we end this week with pirates of a of a of a wrong term, wow. a wrongly named pirates, pirates of a wrong term. Pirates of a wrong term. That was the the yes. sixth pirates movie. Uh, thank you for witnessing this insanity that was uh, part one of Indiana Jones and the Monkey King. We will be back next week at six p.m. Same thing. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for everyone's, your chat, things were amazing, everyone's action gauntlets, well done, that was something we've never done before, so you, you <laughs> handled it like champs. Uh, mm -hmm. We've uh -huh. got more character stuff uh, with these people next week, uh, a lot more, lot more things going on, so make sure that you uh, subscribe to the channel and tune in again every Friday at 6 p.m. We're gonna do this until nobody wants us to do it anymore and they vocally tell Megan to tell them to stop. <laughs> um, so a thank you to everyone here. Thank you to Megan for moderating and giving us all those suggestions from you. Uh, Megan, any uh, good highlights, quotes, or anything from, from users in the chat? Uh, there was a lot of love for the Kermits. There was a lot of love. It makes people think they're on the indie ride at Disney, so it feels like <laughs> it's getting them outside their house. Um, yeah, there was a lot of shout outs along the way. So great job, guys. And thank you, chat room. Hello to everybody that joined us tonight. Uh, Y'all rock. Please come back next Friday and give us more suggestions because I'm having fun. And I, hope I too. Yeah, I hope that this was uh, entertaining for everyone. And I don't know about you, but I'm very sad that this summer we're not really going to get any new movies or anything. So hopefully this will fill a little bit of that void and give you some entertainment to start off your weekend, whether a weekend means anything anymore in the world that we live in, which I live in a jungle, so that doesn't really matter. Uh, I love you all, and this will be archived, so if you missed out, it'll go uh, onto the site, so you'll be able to watch it all, and thank you, Shara, and Dee Dee, and John, and Ted, and Isaac, and Megan, and Brock, who he's not here, but I'll text him, it's cool, it's cool. All right, uh, so until next time uh, in a summer without movies, what else you got to do? All right. Thank Love you, all. Bye. Bye.